Hello, everyone. I'm Luke Ranieri, and I'm here with my friend, colleague, polymath, Chris Davis. How hey. are you doing, Chris? I am doing well on this Saturday morning. <laughs> it is Saturday morning. Oh, I guess it's still morning there. Yeah, yeah, I'm in yeah. Eastern time. Sweet. Yeah. So this is, is the Polymathy podcast. I'd done one of these as a live stream in front of a cactus, which was fun, where I just talked for two hours in front of a cactus about <laughs> how do I resolve these things? And I just looking back and I'm like, wow, people must think I'm utterly uh, ridiculous for spending hours contemplating the, oh, but if I speak Latin from a first BC pronunciation, first century BC pronunciation. How can I possibly make that concord in my brain with a second it, AD century uh, pronunciation of ancient Greek? It's a kind of Socrates. I mean, you have kind of like the dialogue or some, the soliloquy, something like that. Someone could write it down. Exactly. Exactly. So, uh, what I've run to do with uh, this this podcast is, you know, uh, Chris is to now I finally figured out how to do live stream with other people is to get uh, people who are. Um, uh, fascinating people to me uh, that I know who study a bunch of different things, which is what polymathy is to study more than one thing and to have, you know, really um, varied interests and to, um, to, uh, to get into them. Oh, we have some people in the chat. Salve, Logan. Oh, we're not speaking Latin. Hi, Logan. Uh, and hi, David. David's, uh, <laughs> David's pretty cool. David's been uh, recording um, Latin poems and he's, uh, he's getting pretty good at it too. He's been uh, working really yeah. hard. So yeah, it's a big interest that you and I have, of course, is Latin in general and also you know, the, the true sound of an ancient or classical Latin language. So how did you get into Latin, Chris? Um, well, the interesting thing is that I started out when I read the Percy Jackson series, actually. There was a Roman series spinoff. And I think that there was a part, a portion of it where I was really fascinated with the dramatic irony. What I mean is a lot of times I think, and maybe this is just my experience, interacting with Western culture, I was really familiar with like the Roman names for different gods and stuff. And so mm. um, with Percy Jackson, it follows the Greek demigods. And then with this mm -hmm. Roman spinoff that you have, you figure out, oh my gosh, there's a Roman camp too. And so you have these two aspects of the same gods almost going to war with each other. And so with me following mm. the Greek camp, I was like, wait, I kind of have some familiarity with this Roman camp. So I want to become like one of these characters. Now, granted, this was when I was around in 10th grade or something. And so mm. I started to use the language a bit more. I remember one time in 10th grade, actually, in one of my English courses, we had to do, we read this story of mice and men. And I had to make like, I had to write like a rap or something. And so like the initial part of it, I wrote this small poem about the death of hope. And mm. I translated that into uh, using Google Translate into Latin. And then I sang that sort of like in an operatic style and then led in that into the rap. And so therein lies the beginning. And then I started to learn wow. grammar. I, you already knew Spanish yeah. at this point, right? No, I was actually just starting Spanish. I started oh. Latin and Spanish around the same-ish time. Mm. Spanish and first, but yeah. But how long ago was that? Around seven years ago, six or seven years ago. Okay, cool. Nice. Right on. That's fantastic. Yeah, I, uh, uh, I started uh, later than you. I started when I was 20. I was already in college. Um, Italian, I had a little bit from uh, my dad, of course, um, but uh, I was able to actually get fluent when I went to Italy finally, but I was already 20 years old by that point. So, so it's fantastic. Right. Yeah. It's so, yeah. And as far as, uh, yeah, well, let's, uh, yeah. So um, Spanish then. So you um, started saying what, through high school and uh, continuing through college, right? Yes. I started. I was actually kind of almost like a whim decision as much the, the part that's interesting is that as much as I talk about languages now, when I was growing up, I never necessarily had that much of an interest in them. I would see Spanish around. So like you would see it on signs. So you would have Salida and you would have all of these mm. warnings in Spanish and it seemed kind of cool, but it also felt like that thing that people do to get the extra mile. So like when I was in elementary school, for example, there was this one girl who was, who could brag because she could say her alphabet in Spanish. And, um, but other than that, it wasn't necessarily something that I was exposed to. And so in 10th grade, I'm with this requirement, oh, you have to take two years of a foreign language. And so now I have two years left of high school. So I have no other choice. So I go ahead and take Spanish. And um, I decided to do that because it was, first of all, pretty common. And then also I was like, well, I do have some familiarity with the fact that I do have some of this heritage from the side of my grandmother with uh, my grandmother, my dad's side being from Puerto Rico. And so oh, I was like, oh, okay, okay right. I can actually, so I can actually, 
I have a sort of point of contact. I never necessarily met her because she had died before I was born, but it was still mm. that sense of familiarity. Um, and I remember when I first went to the class, my prof my professor, my teacher had said um, that there are some people who can walk into a country and then like for two weeks um, and then after that speak like a native speaker. And I was like, I want to be that person. And so I just really started to study the language. That's awesome. And you did that, right? You were just studying abroad. Yes. And that's and that's actually when I really think that I got um, fluent. I went to Valparaíso, Chile, and I studied there for about five and a half months. And that was a really, really nice experience just because of really the people that I met. Yeah, what's it like there? I, you know, I've, other than seeing you know your pictures and hearing you talk about it in our Latin chats, I haven't, I know basically nothing about Chile. But it's and and also talking about Chile and Latin is an interesting experience indeed for all of those who want to know. But it's um, you walk a lot. There's a lot of hills. <laughs> there are a lot of hills, and I mean. I believe there's a, a mountain range on like the Andes or some some tiny little mountain range, right? Something like that. It's not really that big of a deal, but you'd be surprised how much it comes up. And like I'm still dealing with toe pain from all of the walking. <laughs> oh gosh. And, oh yeah, I didn't have necessarily the shoe the correct shoes for a little bit, but wearing your dance you know, shoes about that my dance shoes were like some brown flats or something that I had around, and so that was what I had before I got actual tennis shoes. Uh -huh. But um. Other than that, it's the city that I stayed in. It's I never necessarily had a frame of reference because I didn't travel a whole lot. It's sort of what you might imagine, like as an urban city, there's a lot of different crevices because of the hills mm. as well. There's lots of different winding paths. There's lots of street art everywhere, different um, street vendors as well. We call them ambulantes, which is, mm -hmm. you know, makes sense with the whole Latin thing. Ambul um, ambulantes. Ambulantes. Yeah. 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 And, <laughs> and so other Walking. than that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Um, and I don't necessarily know how to describe it in any other way. It's just, it's actually one thing that I've been trying to sort of grapple with. Like, how much do I really know about Chile to be able to describe it and to say that it's really affected me? I think that it did have an effect on my Spanish, definitely, because now I speak with a Chilean accent. I use some Chilean slang, not all like of it, some. Um, one is when you're, is way on? Way on. Way on. Way on. Way on. It's, um, a quote of oh, control. Fair. Yeah, put in the the chat there. Yeah, definitely put in the public it, chat. Definitely, it's a um, it's a contracted form of um, huevon, which okay, it it, it kind of just means guy. It's spelled. Well, let me see. I can actually find the uh, chat the option to. Oh the oh oh yeah you have then uh, disregard. T tell me how to spell it. <laughs> w e o n. B e o n. But is there an accent mark on the o? Yes, and then you have. Huevon. It actually has, um, it's somewhat, I guess you could say almost like a curse word, but not really. You have weon, you have wea, which is the neuter form of it. You have weona, which is the feminine form of it. N neuter? There is a neuter form. I remember you of mentioning it. this. Yes. There's a neuter gender grammatically in Chilean Spanish? Well, in this particular, for this word in particular. And so you would use uh -huh. wea for a thing. You would use weon. Weon can mean a whole lot of different things. It can mean a guy mm -hmm. if you're like just a person, like a friend, or if you're um, wanting to insult someone, you might call them way on. You also use a lot of animal terms like gaijo and cabro for um, for people. So mm. for cabro, cabro wow. meaning goat. So yeah. That's, that's incredible. Yeah, because for uh, uh, those, of us who, out, those of you out there who may not know much about um, non-modern uh, uh, romance languages, uh, most of them except for say Romanian, don't have a neuter gender anymore. But Proto-Indo-European, which is this parent language of um, languages from India to Persian through um, ancient Hittite, as well as many European languages, the Germanic languages, the Slavic languages, the Romance languages, and Greek. And just the Greek, that's it. No, no, no one else. Uh, it's Greek. <laughs> one, one little group. And uh, yeah, they, they all have um, had a neuter gender, which so uh, gender, you know, grammatical gender, like that's actually a fun topic. Like why did gr grammatical gender come about? And my understanding of it is people's names just tended to have endings. And the first stage of Proto-Indo-European only had a common gender for, for animates, for humans. Mm -hmm. And um, then it didn't have, uh, then there was another neuter gender for things. A little bit, I think Finnish does something like that, but I don't remember. Logan's in the chat. Tell us about Finnish. Remind me of what their dues, like their pronouns were. He, she is, I think, one pronoun. And then it, it's a non-human one. In Finnish, but Logan's here, so he'll he'll tell us. But um, yeah, the uh, so that's 
the idea. And then later, there ends up developing um, a special set of the of the uh, animate, which is becomes feminine. And then the right, the, the whatever was left was just called masculine or becomes associated with masculine names later. But uh, yeah, so the neuter uh, gender, though, of course, ends up being so similar in Latin to the masculine gender through the late Latin period. You lose the endings, you lose the us and the u, the um and the u. So everything ends up merging, all the o's. It just becomes an o sound at the end. And at that point, um, the except for Romanian, um, there's no vestige left of neuter, really, except for, like, say, um, lo mismo. In Spanish, right? There's a little bit there, right. lo mismo, instead of el mismo, be lo mismo, right? Or right. something, which is cool. There's a little bit of, you know, neuter is, has survived, but but that's really interesting. So that this, this we said, wea is the neuter? Did I understand you? Yes, and it's, interesting. and that's actually something that's, and one thing that actually has been pretty interesting um, as well in this regard is my professor, uh, my, one of my Spanish professors at university has, you know, been talking about, and it's not necessarily new, I'm just bringing it up because since we're on the topic, about how even in Spanish now there's um, a, a tendency now towards more inclusive language. So might so sometimes you might put an X, mm -hmm. X instead of the ending, or you or what is now right. happening is you'll replace it with an E. So that's sort of um, imitating things like with grandis for us in Latin, and the plural would be grandes. And so you would use that E sound mm. instead of the O or A. Like basically a third declension ending. That's interesting. Because yeah. yeah. that's that's how Proto-Indo-European was. The third declension is is um, is in, is in a way. Um, I mean, I don't know enough about Proto-Indo-European just to make such a clear comment. But I mean, like, because <laughs> like, not it depends on which stage of Proto-Indo-European. But you can because third declension adjectives and nouns in Latin, and you see them there them as well in Spanish, French, Italian, and so forth. They end in like a, a N T E, for example, like cantante, which is a word in Romance, right? Um, and there's no distinction of gender. It's interesting that it's sort of you see the language reverting back, uh, back that way. A desire not to distinguish them between masculine and feminine. Um, yeah, there's so actually that, a question. Go ahead, for uh, but go no. ahead. Oh, a question? Sure. What? No, a question for you about uh, so language change. So, like, um, there's a distinction between uh, descriptivism and um, prescriptivism, right? So, like, a prescriptivist, and so I'm been a teacher for years and uh, languages in particular and I always think about um, oh you know this is the standard thing right so if something mm -hmm. that deviates from that okay well it's it's not standard maybe it's not you know maybe it's wrong or maybe it's just you know not not standard um, whereas uh, a more linguistic point of view is to say okay they're just describing the language how it is and that's and that's you know if people are communicating them that way then that is okay and um, when it, uh, it's, it's just sort of a complicated philosophical thing, right? Because we can say, you know, standard um, Spanish is the way it is, but then these changes are being added to it. And who are adding them? Um, like, uh, uh, is that, you know, do, do we accept certain forms of deviations from whatever language? Do we accept them? Do we do we not? What, what what do you have to say about that? This is that this is this is funny because one of my professors has actually talked about this as well, um, and mm. it, he's um, a, he's a cultural anthropologist, and he was talking about how at any stage in the language there are things that are going to be considered incorrect and correct, but they will change over time. So I think it's almost a little bit of both, even though that's a very cop out answer. Um, I think that um, what will happen at any particular stage is that it will change. There will be deviation but because of how we interact with the deviation at any given point in time that will sort of set the trajectory of what kinds we actually are willing to accept so it's mm. so it's, it's so it's an iterative process it's not necessarily one or the other and that's actually one of the biggest things that sort of um makes me insecure about not insecure but um concerned about my spanish sometimes um and you can even can, can bleed over into latin because what i'll do is I'll try and sneak in some vulgarisms because one thing that fascinates me about Latin is if I'm using it in a modern context, how to use slang, basically. Mm. So um, I'll look up different terms and I'll try to approximate it the best that I can um, in as natural sounding ways as I can. And I'll just even sometimes experiment with myself. But as far as it goes to Spanish, there are lots of usages that I may not necessarily know or that I just may not simply employ because 
I, it might deviate from what I know to be correct, but I'm not the only person who mm. does this. I have a friend who's a lawyer, actually, who's from Mexico. And she says that she does not like the Real Academia Española. And she said- Oh, tell us what that is. Yes. I know it, and, maybe not everybody out there knows what it is. But that is the um, official institution that, that decides what is Spanish and what is correct Spanish, more mm -hmm. or less. In Spain, and right? In my that. Yeah, the Royal of yes. Spanish Academy. And yes, exactly. And my my friend doesn't necessarily like it because, for example, there was a particular rule about the accent placement on solo um, that she that was, I guess, omitted or said to be unnecessary. And she continues to follow it, even though the Real Academia said that it's not necessary. But she believes that it's a mistake, and so she uses what might be considered, I guess, obsolete still in her. Spanish. Can you give me that, that example and I'll type it? Yes. Thank so you. like the difference between solo and solo, it's pronounced the same way, it's just that one has an accent mark over it. Mm -hmm. and I'm ex Like escaping. school with an accent or not. It's an orthographical convention. Right. So we use one or the other. I'm actually, it's escaping me. One is meant to mean like alone and the other one means lonely. So uh -huh. I'm going to actually, ha I would have to, yes. Interesting. I would actually have to look that up in order to remember what that rule is because, okay, yeah, so solo with the um, accent, it means only, solely, or just, and then solo, which means alone. Without the accent, just means alone. Without the accent means alone. Yes. But with the accent, it's lonely. Like, it means, like, solely, it's an adverb. Oh, solely, yeah, okay. So, uh, so it's adverb versus adjective. Yes. That's cool. Versus adjective, okay. Cool, is and this so correct? I'm going to put it in the comments. Yes, and so okay, cool. that, and so when even when it comes to um, you want to follow because even this is something that even my mother who studied German but as I studied Spanish it's like you want to follow you want to respect the um, native speakers but that's also almost looking at it in a very monolithic lens because native speakers will jump all over the place some will and all will adhere to what their rules of what correct is. Mm -hmm. it's, Right. You know, what sounds right or doesn't sound right. Because native speakers make mistakes all the time. I think, uh, I believe, uh, solecism, soloikismus. So, I don't know if people, I learned this from Latin grammarian, so I don't know if soloikismus is a word that that uh, is used. Soloik, but it's a, a mistake as opposed to a barbarism. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so soloikismus. Solis, solis, yeah, go ahead. No, yeah. No, it's like solecismo. Solecismo. Oh. Yeah. Uh, he's moose. I can spell Latin. So loi he's moose. I think I spelled that right. Uh, yeah. So like uh, a barbarism being um, a mistake by a barbarus, a foreigner. These are Greek terms, right? And a soloikismus um, being a mistake made by a native speaker. And frequently, for example, I believe still considered to be uh, a mistake to say um, uh, for it's for him and I. This is a gift for him and I. You know, mm -hmm. to, to my ear, it sounds completely wrong. Um, but I know people much older than me too, um, uh, you know, who make that kind of mistake. Officers in the military, I've heard, who you know, been around for a while. So these are w well educated people uh, who use that kind of hyper correction. Um, but it's interesting, uh, you know. And then we could say, what about it's me? You know, it's me as a, um, you know, right. instead of saying soy yo in Spanish, sono yo in Italian, suego in Latin. But c'est moi in French. So even in the Romance world, this usage of uh, an emphatic object pronoun in a nominative position, you know, like a subject, it's it's uh, it's it's weird, huh? Um, and, it is, uh, and that it can go ahead. Go ahead Chris. as well. Yeah. No, no, that's actually sometimes confuses me when I'm translating into like when I wanted to say it's me, like especially when I came home from in Chile, and I would have mm -hmm. to listen just to see if I could hear, it, and they would say soy yo, soy yo, and I was like, oh. Okay, so there's not the indefinite, like, there's not like the little dramatic, <laughs> rhetorical, dramatic pause of it is, and then you define yourself as being what it is. But okay, it's, it's, yeah, it's one of those things where it's like, okay, I have to custom myself to that shift. Right. And, you know, and if, uh, of course, if we, uh, oh, actually, I want to read what uh, Melanie wrote. Yes. Uh, says that she says, yeah, it's true in Mexico, we don't uh, usually remark uh, the difference between uh, solo and solo in, uh, in writing. Yeah. Exactly. It's very, uh, uh, it's interesting how uh, these uh, these changes go. Um, also, uh, David wrote uh, that uh, hoi polo, think about hoi polo, most Americans I know 
uh, it to mean the opposite of what it means to me, which is correct, of course, but now their meaning is becoming standard or correct. Well, what wonder how, how we see that? Well, how is the, is the many, is, uh, is the people. Well, how, I wonder, how is it, David, that Americans are using it? Chris, how do you understand the term hoi poloi? Because we both sure. know Greek. Well, I've never actually encountered this particular term. Oh, really? I've heard it a lot in like um, newspapers and mm -hmm. the context like that, meaning uh, the usage, as I understand, means it's um, the, the people. So the many, the multitude, multitudo, right. um, turma. So, uh, oh yeah, David is saying that's like, elite sounds like, oh, it's a hoi poloi. People are using it to mean it's something elitist. Like, oh, just the, which is the opposite. It's supposed to be elitist people are saying, oh, the common people, the vulgar people, the vulgus are, you know, somehow beneath uh, dignity or, or whatever. Um, yeah, well, so, uh, that, and it's, I find it really interesting uh, confronting, wait, is that Italian? I've been speaking too much Italian lately. In, <laughs> in confronto, wait, that doesn't sound right. Um, <laughs> comparing, there you go, I can English. Um, hey, there's, is that okay? Can I make a, can I invent a verb like that? Will so people be saying to English in a hundred years and be like, oh, that's normal. That's not slangy at all. No, at all, no. Um, when it comes to Latin, right? That's something that interests you like it interests me, finding the, the vox propria, the mm -hmm. proper meaning of a, of a term. What, what are kind of, of things have you been doing with that? I have uh, been getting on an endless rabbit hole of how to <laughs> find computing terms. Um, and that is where a lot of these challenges lie because I look on Wikipedia, the Latin mm -hmm. Wikipedia I'll look on, um, the Neo-Latin lexicon, and then I'll sometimes not like one word or the other, and then sometimes I'll be in the grocery store and I'll be looking up different words, and there's a thousand for something like donut or not potato exactly, but or lemon, as as you've actually covered before. Ah, uh, yes, yes. Thirty minutes so talking about the word for lemon. <laughs> lemon. <laughs> and so, I love this channel. Right. <laughs> And that's actually one thing that I've been um, that I've been uh, sort of doing a little bit of a adventure on with different programming terms, different hardware terms. When I was in Chile, actually, all of my notes in my Spanish networking class were written in Latin, which made labs extra fun for my partners. I knew you were doing because that. They what, would be what, like, I couldn't read your notes. <laughs> <laughs> right, no, that, that's one thing. They were like, what, one, what of my partner, and the unfortunate thing is that just because of how some so social things worked out in Chile, we only were able to have one lab, but my partner looked at my notes and he was like, what? why? <laughs> why did, why did you do this? But it's, it's, it's an actually interesting exercise because it requires me to look up what these terms mean. So right. even words like bitmap, which is a format. It's, okay. What's it's, an example? An example of a bitmap. A bitmap image might just be any sort of program. You know, if anybody remembers, like Microsoft Paint. I remember Microsoft program Paint. that you could draw. Things. <laughs> yes, I remember. Okay. So that means so, the, uh, so in the in um, the television like, show uh, Community, um, they had a problem uh, with their permanent records. They had to force everybody to repeat a year because all of their school records were recorded on Microsoft Paint, and it, <laughs> and it crashed. <laughs> Anyway, uh, sorry, but Microsoft no, Paint. Yeah, no, that's fine because that's actually because it's what it is. Um, if you save that image, normally it will save as a bitmap, and what a bitmap mm. is kind of like its name suggests is that every bit corresponds to a color. So it is a, mm. so it's like a two dimensional map for the colors. And so then when I'm translating that into Latin, I was like, okay, I can now understand what this means, and so now I have a better grasp of the concept. That doesn't right. necessarily mean that as I go to translate it, that I'll pick the right words. But the exercise itself gives me a better, ex but it gives me a better understanding of the concept, even words like server or um, firewall. Which well, what, you would uh, think what firewall would with... Oh, sorry, go ahead. But okay, uh, for yeah. ser no, yeah. no, no, yeah. That's, that's fine. Even like yeah. for the word bit, I've come up with the word calculus. Um, for the word, and calculus, coming from the word calculus, there's also, um, what is a calculus in Latin? A calculus is like a stone, um, cool. a small stone that's used for reckoning. And this is actually a semantic mm -hmm. loan from the Greek word for bit, um, which kind of hmm. can mean something like that. But interesting. 
this is actually something that I found on Wikipedia and I, I looked it up. And so it, it does seem to be valid. So then using that semantic mm. loan and then calculus, the thing with calculi, the, cal the calculi in Latin right. times is that they were used for voting. So you would have a white stone for ascension and then a black stone for, you know, disagreement. And so that actually mirrors very well the binary system. From mm -hmm. that point, you have the, um, the word nibble, which is in between a bit and a bite. Um, and so a I'm not familiar with a that term. Nibble. Yeah, neither was I. I learned this last. A bite year. is eight bits, <laughs> um, right? Right, and a nibble is four. That's adorable. It is. And so what I did was <laughs> I was like, calculus. Calculus is actually a diminutive of another word, calx. And calx is a homonym between stone and heel. So, so I took that. It is a calx. Yes. No. No. Not yet. That's a nibble. Oh, that's a nibble. I'm sorry. Wait, let me what? take that off. <laughs> wait, what? So, so a calx is. So wait, okay. Tell me, tell me all three. I'll write them all okay. down. So you have bit as cal as calculus, nibble as calx, and then tarsus as bite is which. I oh, have. that's very yeah. clever. I and like that. That's and fun. A, yes, and a tarsus. The reason why I chose that one is because it has seven bones, and so mm. the number seven in computing is eight. So. That's right. That's hey. If the, if seven equals eight, it makes as much sense as the Roman calendar and every other Roman counting system. That is exactly what I said. Who so doesn't love I. the fact that we're three days before the Ides, and then to, which is okay? Like, what's today is today is Calendai. Ah, Hodies, Calendai uh, Augusti, right? Calendai Augusti. Yes. All right. So how, there were thirty-one days in July. I'm writing this down so I can keep track. So that means. <laughs> The, um, July 29 was, um, in Latin, would be uh, ante diem uh, tertiam or tertium calendas august, augustas, right? Like, oh, so yes. That's, that's what the date was. Okay. So that means July 30th. Well, that would have to be ante diem secundum. Nope. <laughs> you would think no, so. No, 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 no. We have a separate, we have a separate word for this. Oh no! Wait, did I mess this up? Oh no! I messed this up. Darn it! No, I made it even. I made it even worse mess of it because I got now confused. Now you the entire chat. Luke. Oh now, my now they're gosh. not going to like it anymore. Oh my god! So July thirtieth is ante diem tertium. So July thirtieth is ante diem tertium. Okay. So therefore, the last day of the month, July thirtieth, July uh, darn it, July thirty first, <laughs> July thirty first, the day before the calends, the calendai, which means the first of the month. <laughs> that would have to be the second day before the uh, but wait a minute, no it's not, it's the day before so you just say pridie, the day before calendas augustas so that one is actually correct and then followed by July 31st as the day before, so actually this one uh, should I be ante diem secundam but it's not, it's ante diem tertian so somewhere in there they lost, they lost a day so if yeah. computing language and Latin obviously have this in common. <laughs> so no, so I think that they would it goes together beautifully. And so this is but this is one of the things that I would constantly engage in. It's an iterative process um that that can sometimes make note taking a lot longer than it needs to be. But it's 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 something that I really, really do enjoy. <laughs> yeah, me too. I, I remember it all the time when I was um in my my first years getting into Latin. I'm tired of standing, I'm gonna sit down. It's just my camera a little bit. There we go. And uh, part of a temple. That's fun. Anyway, um, the uh, yeah, I um, always liked to uh, take notes and last. And I found it really helpful to learn. And then, if, of course, the thing that you're studying the most, you want to do in that language. So I was doing that all the time with geology notes I was taking in Latin. Of course, the sciences, it can help because a lot of terms are applicable. Um, but, uh, how did, so yeah, obviously therefore you have an interest in computer science. So oh, yes. what, uh, what, tell us about that. Well, that was my first love when it came to academia. I, uh, started, really? yes, I started, um, really wanting to get involved in video game design. And that was, um, when I started to get into, um, Sonic the Hedgehog as a kid. <sighs> yes. Yes. I, Me I was, too. I had a game gear. Oh my gosh. I had my Don't my wonderful yourself. parents. No, I'm 35. It's okay. Everybody knows. Okay. That's fine. Uh, yes. At Game Gear it was you got it was that got to be at least that big, you know, and I 
it was the alternate device because everybody had a Game Boy, but the Game Gear, you know, had color, you know, it was like had a little TV screen. It almost reminds me of like how yeah, archaic it must be compared to modern devices. If I saw one, it would be like seeing those things in Star Trek where, you know, it's supposed to be this fancy device, but it still has this cathode ray tube curved right. shape to it. <laughs> right. Because like that. that's what it was. It wasn't a flat screen yet. It was curved. This little that, cathode ray tube thing. That act, that's a, that is beautiful. That's actually, um, even when it comes to video game design, I do like, I guess this would like the retro look. There's something about it that was appealing when I was growing up. I liked the I liked the aesthetic of it. I liked mm. all of the circuits, all of the wires. It made me feel like, you know, I was entering a new world. And so that's why even as I was growing up, things like Tron or even the, the kids show Cyber Chase would really, really interest me. because You like, liked oh the movie God, Tron as a kid? Tron Legacy when I saw it as a slight oh. as a teenager. Yes, yes. Okay, I graduated college <laughs> at that point, so uh, I, I had to go back and watch the original to appreciate the new one because I didn't see. I wanted to go see the one, the, the new one in the theater, but I should watch the original. And then I was like, "Oh, um, <laughs> it's a, I mean, it's fascinating for its time. It was way ahead of its time for nineteen, gosh, seventy something, seventy nine, oh, wow. something like that. It's oh, yeah. yeah, or eighty one. I forget what it was, but it's it like it has computer graphics in it, and it's really early uh, computer graphics, but." Um, anyway, I'm sorry, Sonic the Hedgehog. No, I'm no that's here. fine. It's a, a, yeah. a detour to Tron is not a bad thing. But that's when I was, um, I was, I would, I remember when I was speaking of Microsoft Paint, I would draw things and like ships or whatever, and I would didn't know how to move them. Like I wanted to make it like a game, so I would select it and move it around and act like I was moving through some sort of world. My mm. friends at recess, we would have a killer time pretending we were characters from these things. And I just, that's how I think I started really getting involved in the process of like story creation. Um, I liked writing, I liked programming. That's when I first started to program, I taught myself primarily was when I was in fifth grade, we started to learn HTML, web page design stuff. And then from that, I started to learn JavaScript and it just took off and I learned C++ in university and it wasn't necessarily difficult to transfer to, tr um, translate the concepts it was it was it was pretty easy and i really enjoy um the field mm -hmm. i'll stay up nights i've stayed up nights sometimes working on the same problem trying to figure out why my computer does not love me why does it not want to work and this is programming you're talking about right yes. yeah that's that's yes. something i never i i started to learn too late and it was unfortunately not a great situation for me <laughs> trying to deal with uh, learning programming i'm afraid so i I'm admire very language. much I, what was I doing? Which um, language did you start with? Um, well, that's part of the problem. Uh, <laughs> but no, I, I mean, I really started out learning a bit of, because I have, you know, my very simple websites, including lucranieri.com, obviously. I can, I know basic, very, very basic HTML stuff. Mm -hmm. But I taught myself just like looking at the codes of other websites and having, you know, just going far enough so I could make the web page like I wanted to. And then like, that was it. My father's website, robertranieri.com. That's probably the best looking website I've made. Of course, it has his artwork. There's one of his paintings right here, which is um, awesome. the others are are um, uh, ancient Greek temples and stuff that are just. That, but that that one's actually his artwork. That one rather, um, and uh, that website's actually uh, looks pretty good. Like I actually figured out how to do some stuff, um, like CSS things and yes. Uh, I like CSS because it's so much, you know, more flexible. But that's most of what I know how to do. <laughs> um, actual computer programming. Oh, I did. What did I have a problem with? One of my it's a problem with my hard drive or something, and I couldn't figure out what it was. This was like a month ago, and I oh, is my um um my external hard drive wasn't working, and I could not get mm -hmm. it to to respond to me. But I was able to oh, use. Yeah. Uh, I found some something online with some code. I was able to enter on the terminal. And it just started working again. Because I, I, I had like my, my all my video editing work saved on it because I bought that hard drive just for that purpose. And then it stopped working like after I transferred everything into it and then deleted it off my hard drive on my computer. Oh, <laughs> so no. It's like, well, at least they're still on YouTube, you know. Um, it was a good but ride. I didn't end up <laughs> it was a good ride. I can't reuse any of that stuff. But um, anyway, so that's I'm very, very limited. Just, you know, just enough to get by. So, no, that's yeah. What are you gonna? What do you want to do with it? With that uh, experience? What I do want to do is um, 
I either want to pursue video game design or actually get involved in cybersecurity. I did an internship before my trip to Chile to actually help fund me. Really? I did a paid internship at a uh, startup company here um, called Ooh. Forge Institute. And Ooh. it has mm -hmm. the, the whole goal of it is to sort of bridge the, um, is in, at least in my state, which is Arkansas, is to bridge the gap between um, the private sector and the public sector because the private sector owns most of what we would consider critical infrastructure. And so, mm -hmm. um, but the government, the public <clears throat> sector actually has most of the intelligence that is needed to help defend these assets. And so there needs to be some sort of communication between a trusted little branch. And that's sort of what this company is uh, trying to get involved in. Um, and hmm. It's been, and it was an interesting experience. I primarily wrote blogs, but it still gave me exposure to different companies. Diff it was like a launching pad that I could use to so sort of pursue different opportunities. And so I'm grateful for the experience. That's fantastic. Cool. I really admire that. I'm interested in the, in the field as well. What are, um, I don't know anything about cybersecurity except what I have to do in, in the military to, you know, make sure my, Sometimes my, um, <laughs> my, no, no, just like everybody in the military, you have to, you know, have annual training and stuff. So that's, right. I know, you know, about the basics of cybersecurity, you know, how we want to compartmentalize things appropriately that are government related, you know, you don't take paperwork and just put it on your own computer, that kind of thing. That's, that might have. Why not? Uh, you know, well, because you get hacked, you know, we don't want no, that. Uh, well, that's what's <laughs> cybersecurity. Um, the fascinating thing is that cybersecurity works basically on the premise that nobody um, can actually access your computer without your permission. And the, and that sounds like a really weird concept until then mm -hmm. you have to get to this whole point of understanding, well, how do we translate the concept of permission into a, onto a computer? Hmm. And that's where a lot of the flaws lie now. Well, a lot of with viruses, with cybersecurity, what you're doing is you're not trying to keep a company or an entity 100% from being hackable. Every company is hackable. Hmm. And even when you're talking about things on the level of critical infrastructure, you pretty much want to assume that you already have been hacked. You just might not know it. What you want to do is you want to work within a sort of uh, appropriate threshold of risks. You want to create a cybersecurity plan, a policy plan. And all of that is just basically a list of requirements for what people in the company, in the government institution or whatever need to do in order to meet a certain level of requirements to secure certain parts of the system. It's yeah. not a perfect thing at all. And it oftentimes has to be updated because of um, just different changes in the attack service, which is sure. just opportunity to attack. Like the human immune system, it's always bombarded by yeah. attacks, and some get in and are and get dealt with. I guess the difference is that a computer system have its own immune system. You working in cybersecurity are the immune system, and you have right. to deal with those threats. Uh, and that's yeah. actually, I think that's what fascinated me about cybersecurity when I first started to do some research in it, because it, of that analogy with you know biology. Um, then you have all of that Tron stuff, cyber chase stuff, and I was like, oh, this sounds really, really light good. cycles. Light cycles. Exactly. I can just sort of like zoom through the wire, just kind of, oh my gosh. Uh, Ethan asks, uh, Chris, do you have a comment on the new quantum computing work that's being done at the moment and how it's going to influence cryptography and security? Well, sort of regurgitating stuff from my professor, the thing with a quantum computer is what it's more than likely going to do is make some of our algorithms obsolete, not necessarily to the point of... Um, Eh, sí, y and also to pause, y Moise, sí, yo puedo entenderte. Um, I'll put that up. Hold on, here it is, yeah. Um, Moise yeah. Sánchez uh, asks, ¿Cuántos idiomas y cuáles hablan ustedes dos? ¿Puedes entenderme? Sí, claro que sí. Ser claro. poliglotas uh, los ha ayudado en la computación. That is a really good question. Uh, so to translate for um, <clears throat> those of you who haven't learned Spanish yet, which you can really easily, I have a little, I need to make a video about it, about um, uh, destinos, destinos, um, the uh, way to learn Spanish is fantastic video series. It's so cute. Um, but um, I do have an article about it on, on lucranieri.com slash polymathy. But my point is that Moises says, how many languages do these two speak? Or do you two speak, rather? Uh, can you understand me? Yes, we understand you. And does it help being a polyglot dealing with um, inf uh, information science, computer science? That's a good question. What do you think? Um, I think is also... Computing lang languages are all comparable to human speech languages 
And then also to answer the other one as well with Ethan, I think that quantum computing, what it'll mm -hmm. do is it'll make a lot of the algorithms that we have obsolete on one hand, because they will be able to, you will be able to calculate the keys for a lot of these different uh, crypto systems. And otherwise, but it probably won't necessarily change the methodology. We'll just have to develop stronger systems in order to basically combat the quantum computing uh, conundrum, because that is something that did come up a lot of times. For right now, it's not as mm -hmm. big of an issue. Um, but then so we they're, also they're have more to... hackable. Is that is that correct? And I'm I'm, an, I'm very naive about this. No, no, it's like there are different with with a cryptographic with a cryptographic key, which you're basically. Um, what you what it basically is is just a it's like a more or less like a password that's generated by the computer mm. and there are different ways of acquiring these different passwords and one of them is by calculating them but the mm -hmm. problem is that what complicates this is not all malware necessarily relies on hacking the keys and then also when you talk about quantum computing you're probably talking about nation state levels stuff that's going to be able to have access to this stuff first and so mm -hmm. they might not go they're not going to necessarily hack everybody but have specific targets but even then still probably operating under different political rules that go that govern foreign um, international affairs foreign affairs so it's not going to be as simple as quantum computing will lead to the end of the world because there's just a lot because with cybersecurity, <laughs> the thing about it is that <laughs> It, but no, cybersecurity isn't just about um, the computer itself. It's about how people use them. So like even if you talk about, and this, I only bring this up because it was an example that was used in my class. Um, if you talk about voting machines, you can't hack a voting machine. Those are probably one of the, so, some of the most secure systems that we have in our world. What you do is you attack the way that that data is transferred because that's where the mm -hmm. weakness might lie. Or you attack a weaker system that is sort of like a stop on the way of that data getting to where it needs to go. And that's what sometimes people don't necessarily recognize that it's a lot about their own usage of a system. Phishing attacks, for example, they take advantage of someone's, you know, almost like suspension of disbelief. So if mm -hmm. someone believes that the email sounds reasonable or sounds like something they want, they will open the link and that's when their system mm -hmm. becomes uh, becomes an entry point. But otherwise, as far as like being a polygot, does it help with cybersecurity? I think that it can, depending on the context. In the immediate sense, I want to say no, just because a lot of computing terms revolve around English. Um, there are certain computing terms in Spanish. There are vox propriae, vox es propriae in Spanish for computing terms. So like, if I'm not mistaken, switch, a switch is properly in Spanish, a might be switch or might be serve. It might probably is router. That's what I think it is. Router. Right. It's properly direccionador. But normally, what you what I would hear at least in Chile is just router. And so, right. so yeah. a lot of times it doesn't necessarily make the biggest impact. But I think that where it does come into play is with that trust building factor. Because that's one because of going back to the idea with cybersecurity or with even with compute with computer science in general or any field, one of the biggest, um, and you're welcome, Ethan, no problem at all. Um, and one of the biggest things when it comes to collaborating, especially with an international world is you want to be able to build trust in cybersecurity. You want to have that level of trust. And so language can be an avenue by which you can do that by speaking someone's native language. It's not to hmm. say that you're going, it, depending on the depth of the relationship, especially, you can actually really gain that person's trust and you can sort of create a useful tie that can become an asset unto itself. So, yeah. So, and that's responding to what uh, Moises was asking about, does yes. it help to know foreign languages? Can so you, you're saying from the, um, the, just but if you have a business that ends up being international, knowing more than one language is helpful because even if you don't know the language fluently, you speak a few words of it, you you demonstrate to the person that we uh, that um, you know the language as because <clears throat> my says he wanted to because of course we're both American and uh, Americans don't tend to know a lot of other languages so right. although this was a you know, nice little pleasant surprise for Moises that we don't, both can read Spanish you know we can we can answer his his question and then and therefore Moises hi man we're, hey. uh, we're it's it's like oh it's it builds this 
instant rapport. It's kind of like you meet somebody who's seen every episode of Star Trek. Like, well, I mean, we're now nah, we're buddies well, forever. You know, we we got we're in. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, that kind of kind of thing where we like the same um, Disney movies or what you know whatever it is. Um, uh, we're you know Manchester United or whatever. La Viola, Firenze, you know whatever uh, thing it is that's um, <laughs> exactly. that's that, yeah. It's a kind of instant. Um, it's a shorthand way of of communicating because communication is so much about actually building uh, rapport with people. And it, if people are truly from alien societies with almost nothing in common, then you have to take you know long time to do that. Um, I think cinematic examples would be something like Dances with Wolves, right? Where you have these cultures that are combined and then eventually the people learn enough about each other to actually form a close connection. And there's many other connections. Of course, Avatar, which is a the um, other version of that story being told, shall I say, yes. uh, which is interesting. But otherwise, as far as being a, a poly, knowing uh, more than one, human language, spoken language, um, hasn't uh, hasn't been, it's because the computer languages don't operate the same way as spoken languages. So there's no necessary crossover there, you're saying, right? Other than right. clearly, and that's, you know, and that's yeah. why, Go ahead. right, and that's why I had to sort of like, you have to sort of broaden the, um, the, the perspective of what computacion actually is. Um, because if we're talking about programming languages, most popular programming languages are going to be based in English. There are programming languages that are based in other languages, but they're not going to be used as much. And mm. so a lot of it is, I, I think that's actually one of the reasons why when I wanted to go to Chile, one of the ways that I was sort of justifying the trip or trying to, or not even trying to pump myself up so much as thinking about the value that I would gain from it, the utility of the trip would be, I would be learning Spanish precisely to help me with you know, computacion to help me with um, computer science to actually understand, mm. well, what is computer science in Spanish? But it really right. wasn't all that inaccessible. The Spanish wasn't a barrier. What yeah. it was more of what I found myself using Spanish mostly for was to connect with people, making friends. Mm. And that's where a lot of those, a lot of dear memories come into play with. Yeah. yeah. Being able to express ourselves. And, and um, remind me after we answer this one to, uh, to mention it. So, um, hello, Marvin. Wenn Sie Deutsch können, dann sollte das die schwerste Sprache sein, denke, denke ich, he says. So, when you can speak German, then you've, you can do, you should, you should be able to do the hardest language. <laughs> and, and I'm like, ah, oh, Deutsch ist leicht. Das gefällt mir. Wir haben auch Logan in dem Chat, im Chat und er auch Deutsch sprechen. Uh, Deutsch person can. Wow, my German's terrible. So um, German is a lovely and not too terribly <laughs> difficult language if you get good teachers, which I had. I've barely spoken it for mm -hmm. years, though. And Moises and also Marvin asked, how many languages do we speak? Well, how many do you speak? Or, I mean, and that's, that's you know, like, how many languages do you speak? You studied, of course, a lot. But uh, what, right. start with your best ones and then work your way go, down. Go down. I guess. All right, then. So my best yeah. one is so far is going to be English. The next would be Spanish. It's a mm -hmm. tie between Portuguese and Latin. And then mm -hmm. from that point, we would have sign language, um, which is a language I was exposed to as a little as when I was really, really little, but I didn't necessarily practice it a whole lot. Um, but I can fingerspell. It's not necessarily anything advanced, not like this, but... If you say fala portuguese? Eu posso um pouco, mas... Pra, uh, Muito bem. Mine's terrible. I'm sorry, no, all of our Portuguese também, figures. No, também. It, 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 no, it's just the nasal voice. vowels from Latin. I like do <laughs> it, all the nasal vowels I got from Latin, and then just... You know, like, no, <laughs> try like my that, best. it's a fancy Spanish accent. It's really fun to say, but sometimes... It's like I can write it and read it, a little bit better than I can actually speak it, but I'm 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 trying to get a a, a handle on it. A lot of the memes on these different um, Brazilian meme pages that I follow on Instagram they help me with the listening. I aspect. love Brazilians, and I find they're really interested in Latin. And I don't know, in particularly why that is. Um, <clears throat> there's a, a very large um, population of Spanish speakers in the Americas, but. Uh, I, maybe it's because there's there are 200 million of them approximately in Brazil. Somehow that leads to some kind of unified, I don't know, cultural something such that I have a huge number of, um, uh, I would say a, a larger number of Brazilians specifically that follow me now on Scorpio Martianus in this channel, on Polymathy and on Instagram and other places. Oh, which is great. And uh, oh, hello, hi, Gabrielle um, in Brazil. Uh, oi, hola. And um, 
uh, and uh, it's and I just I find it really interesting that there's so many people interested in Latin from Brazil, and there's a comparable number from the Americas, but I. So my just you know without any statistical thing uh well actually i can be a little statistical because like my followers like us followed by uh like italy and then uh, then brazil is like number three of course these wow. are big countries yeah like brazil number three i mean and you would expect you know it almost every italian in school and high school if they go through high school they end up studying a little bit of latin um so there's you know latin's my main my channel in scorpio martiano so and yet a huge number in brazil and not so many that I can easily define from the other South American countries. So I don't know why that is. That's but, actually, yeah, that's really interesting to observe. Like uh, sometimes I'll play this game where I will try and list cognates <laughs> to, to my friends who either speak Portuguese, who speak Spanish. It doesn't necessarily always work. It's not, I've, and I've mentioned it so many times. Um, but for me, um, it's but I've mentioned it so many times that it's that's part of my reputation now at, at the university, um, huh. even in the physics department. Hmm. It was, um, but the but the but it doesn't necessarily for me, and that's probably just because of my limited interaction with people who are from Latin America, who are from Brazil. Um, hmm. I haven't actually been able to. I haven't necessarily seen that all the time. It might invoke a little bit of some mild interest, but then. I don't, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's not a pan-cultural thing for Brazilians, but there's just, I'm kind of a critical mass. Like Italians, there's only 60 million of them, and there's even fewer in Spain. Right. And yet I have a, also a pretty big following of uh, Spanish, native um, Spaniards. Um, but I don't know, maybe it's a critical mass thing, or uh, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know why, because there's also plenty of great people from Portugal, too, I know, uh, who like uh, Scorpio Martianos. But um, anyway, a milky armpit asked uh, too, which language do you find was the hardest to learn and why? Mm. That's a really good question. What do you think, Chris? Um, the hardest to learn for me, it was probably Latin only because of the mm. only because of the grammar. It was yeah. a little bit overwhelming at first because I didn't necessarily have Well, I started with um, National Archives. Um, to just, it was a website that really talks about medieval Latin at first, but it gives a good overview oh, of some different cases. And so, so I you've was done like, some intense study of medieval Latin, huh? Not intense, but I was, but I was just trying to get a sense of, well, what did the Romans, because I don't want to speak how the, but then, but that was like my early de years of. You didn't want know. to speak like the Romans. You wanted to speak something later. No, I wanted to speak like the Romans. And oh, like the Romans. Like, and so like when they were talking about. But go ahead, like, continue. Sorry. No, like when the, they were saying that in medieval Latin, they didn't necessarily use cases as much as like, I don't want easy i want the real raw <laughs> language and so um is, is that a country song what if who's is that zach brown man who said i don't want easy you're like this uh I want, I want crazy is it anyway uh one of my no, favorite it's, acapella it's, groups it's, uh sings it so wow what, yeah. which, which group home free they won sing no, off season four oh Oh, I'm free. I don't remember who the original singer is, though, for, for that. I think it's a country song, but they're a country a cappella group, so I love them. Actually, not because they're country. Actually, I didn't like country music until I, I fell in love with that a cappella group. And then I'm like, oh, I see now country is, I see why it's amazing. This is pretty cool. And I, and I hope I didn't lose like 800 followers. Yeah, and <laughs> that, I could, that are no, anti it was actually more like a thousand. But, but no, it's it's fine. I sometimes have like country music. There's a Rascal Flatts album that I used to listen to when I was younger. But hmm. um, when I was, but the, and I think that was because of the grammar, because one thing that would confuse me is I could understand the concept of the grammar. What I would fig, what I would get lost in early on was how to write it because you would have different declensions but then you would also have different adjective endings. So you would have mm. words like firmos, for example, and us. Mm. I mean, okay, that kind of changes in the same way that the noun it's attached to changes. But then what confused me was then you have words like tristes, which is sad. And then the ending doesn't necessarily look like the noun. So you might have rosa tristes. And I'm like, okay. Right, uh, exactly. But, it's, but, you still have now an adjective agreements, but they're different declensions, and that's not immediately visible, like, say, Finnish, where, where it doesn't have gender, but it has all the, en the endings are much more similar, as I recall, from what little I know. Logan, probably, let me give us some examples. <laughs> yes, and that's, ac and that's exactly uh, what, um, and, and that's exactly what happened. It was a little bit confusing. And when I started to really get involved in the language it started to make a lot more sense and that's why and now and now it's not difficult 
as much. The only the part that's difficult ish now is really just uh, vowel quantity. But I've been sort of reading to myself a little bit. Oh, so you've been trying to pay attention to that. Streets ahead of like the the hoi polloi as <laughs> David was saying <laughs> earlier. Yeah, I mean that's something obviously I constantly, endlessly, andam cantile nam cano. I'm always singing the same song, which is the Latin idiom for being a broken record. Oh, I'm like constantly man. talking about vowel. And just like I like Khrushchev's shoe banging on the podium and say, long vowels, long vowels, and just <laughs> endlessly <laughs> annoying people about these are important. We need to learn, you know, but I mean, practically speaking, once people have already learned a language in a certain way to change the way that they do it, if they don't have sufficient motivation to do so, I totally understand. So right. I hope I don't come off as as abrasive as I probably appear or so people have accused me of being because I just love everybody who's speaking Latin, period. And if it's if you're doing the vowel length thing, then I do love you a little bit more. But <laughs> you <get laughs> you're fantastic now. at it is my point. And you're incorporating yeah, it into this, the songs you're translating and yes. writing. And it's it's fantastic. Yes. And then also, um, Melanie, to answer your question, what was the... Oh, wait, no, I'll put up her question. I wanted to wait till okay. you were done your sentence before I interrupted you with Melanie's question. No problem. And then, and uh, Chris and Luke, why did you learn Spanish? Uh, ¿Y qué fue lo más difícil de aprender de español? What was the most difficult part about learning Spanish? Como hispano hablante, siempre es un gusto ver que hay gente que quiere aprender este bello idioma. Estoy de acuerdo, And it Melanie. is. It sí. is. It's so pretty. Con, completamente. Wait, I can't see my sí, face. Y también es muy... the way, and, <laughs> it, and a little bit. Y también es muy, es muy útil para descargar mi frustración con cualquier cosa que yo quiero hablar. And that is what I said was, um, it's also very useful if I want to rant because for anything that I'm, that, that's like in my, on my mind, because that's actually what happens sometimes now when I'm using Spanish to rant. That's the most difficult thing, I think, for Spanish. The part that was mm. difficult for Spanish for me was um, at first, it was how to trill because at first, when I started, I did not know how to trill. I sounded like a broken smoothie machine. I, I, I sounded like a broken blender. But then, and then was I like also broken like, smoothie machine? That sounded more fun, actually. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and I also didn't the the D's and sometimes the combination of L and R. I remember one time I was pronouncing mm. this word el refresco, el refresco, and I was like, "How do you get the L and the R?" El the refresco. Well, they merge right. in right. Any, like right. like in Sardinian, if I remember. Yeah, I think it's Sardinian. Um, uh, I'm ninety eight percent sure it's Sardinian. Uh, like il or el in Sardinian, it's er. It becomes like er. It um, if I remember it. No, no, no. It's not that. Oh, no, I think I'm thinking of Roman dialect actually of Italian. Anyway, there's yeah. a, it, this um, eroticism, lambdicism. I think they call it, where it's an interchange of like. Um, like Corona, cor cor uh, Colonel. That's like actually a better example. Could say Corona. Oh, yeah. mm. um, a a um, a crown, cor which is Corona in Latin and Spanish, uh, Italian, and other languages. Well, it ends up going through a lambdicism stage where the ra is close enough to a la, so we get colo. And then the word for Colonel in English is pronounced Colonel with an R, but it's spelled with an L because of the predominant influence of Spanish culture. In um, Europe, at the time, the English spelling was adopted uh, was adapted to conform with the Spanish military term from coronel to colonel, but the pronunciation with the R remained, such that our modern English pronunciation of a ra ends up being the one that we still use wow. for colonel, even though because because yeah, let's spell it like it's pretty. There's colonel, which is I believe that's correct spelling in English, though he heaven help me, I'm not sure. And then as opposed to um, you know, or S is Coronel. Anyway, I'll uh, put those up. Yeah, that's what I recall when I was looking up the etymologies. That's Wait, so that's that, so that's a that's a normal difficulty, I think, in just human speech. And that's and there's also um and when, even when I was starting to practice things like the de, mm. um, because I noticed that it wore the te specifically because I noticed mm. even early on that it started like a like a T. But the part that's most difficult for me now when it comes to learning Spanish is just more of um how is how to actually express myself with sort of color. Um I try I've I've gotten a bit better at it now because I also adopt a lot of um that's what was difficult for me. It was the inflection pattern in Spanish because I mm -hmm. remember when I would first talk before my trip, I had a friend who would be like, um, you know, speak with someone of an Italian accent and I didn't know what she meant. And then when I went- You had an Italian like, accent in Spanish? No, she was asking me to kind of imitate that sound 
when I spoke Spanish. And I think the kind of musical talking. Exactly. And that's what happens in Chilean Spanish and probably in just Spanish in general. And I didn't know this. The inflection pattern in Spanish, it, it exists, but it's just that I was using an English inflection pattern, not necessarily with stress mm. or an accent, but just how it was modulating my pitch in terms of Spanish. And so that was like the next stage and actually having to understand that. I remember one time when we were at a group and I was uh, a Latin group and I was speaking Latin, but I was using sort of the pitch shift that I had used in Chile. And that's exactly um, what I was learning, what I was experimenting with. Yeah. And, and I, uh, I, f I find I have the same difficulty as I'm comfortable speaking Latin and Italian. I mean, one of the biggest parts of my accent is, um, in fact, you could hear it um, <clears throat> in the uh, live stream I got to do yesterday with the wonderful Irene Regini, Satora Lang's Latin podcast, Latin YouTube channel, wonderful, uh, everything she does, where she's actually Italian. And um, it's she speaks basic, it, it, in every, almost in every way exactly how I want to speak that because she's Italian, she has this placement, which is not um, subject to the certain characteristics of normal English phonology, which is rather, there's a certain placement, to use a singing mm -hmm. term, inside the mouth, which if we if we don't, if we don't put these sounds inside the mouth, then we sound Italian, you know, we, that's to use a terrible kind of stereotypical accent, because Italian, um, why a lot of people in Europe during the um, classical music period thought that ah, Italian is the proper language for language for singing opera because the sounds are already projected forward. And if you have to sing to fill a whole um, theater space, then it has that that kind of inherent nature of the language and of the singers to, to constantly put the sounds in front of their mouth like that. That really good diction is why, uh, you know, Italian was associated with really good, good singing and sound. And that's but to be good at speaking English, to sound native, particularly with an American, a general American accent like, like we speak, it has to be uh, more inside the mouth, otherwise it sounds right. like something else. And so that's a huge part of my accent, which is funny. I notice that when I speak, um, I try to speak ecclesiastical Latin, I, I'm part of me is comically and consciously and subconsciously imitating Italians speaking ecclesiastical pronunciation. And right. then, I, then I'm like, I sound better. Uh, <laughs> and not because I'm saying cha and ja and sa, but because I'm thinking of Italians more and I'm sounding, you know, because I want to try to, I would be delighted if I sounded like a Spaniard speaking Latin, who is, you know, Spaniards are, uh, among other Romance language speakers, Sardinians, Italians, all have um, a kind of authenticity to the sound of how they speak Latin, which is, you know, which I want to imitate. Go ahead. And no, that's exactly sometimes what I'll do is I'll, when I'm talking to myself, I will actually uh, do that. I will try it. I will imagine myself as almost like maybe a Spanish speaker, like, or a Romance language speaker or an Italian. When mm. I speak, when I use certain words, like when, especially when I'm using slang, so like, um, or my invented slang. So when someone, sometimes, for example, if I wanted to, I have a cousin, a little cousin who was recently born. Well, not recently, it was a few years ago. And so I would speak to her in Latin at first. And so she would just kind of mm. look at me. And, um, and it, it seemed like she was entertained. But um, as I was thinking about it, because I would say things like, puelula, puelula. But I also encountered, um, I had an article that I read um, a few years ago about consonant, not a few years ago, last year, what am I talking about? Um, it was about consonant doubling that would happen in vulgar Latin. And so it would actually gave a little bit of a list of different terms in Latin. So that's where I mm -hmm. encountered terms like amma for mother or nonna for grandmother. And mm -hmm. then you have words like picus and micus for small. And so like mm -hmm. I can imagine saying, like calling her mico. Right. Or, for a small person, small or popa, or popa. Wow. And miko, is it, it, what's the of miko? Is it from like mea or something? Mikus, I think that probably is maybe a corruption like micro from Greek. Inter because there's mika. Mika is a Latin word which Italians still use to mean hardly. The Latin version of weeks in Italian, it's mika. Yeah. Or especially you hear it all the time in Tuscany, like a uh, like, uh, like, uh, mich. Like uh, mija, mija, this is mija, mika. Mika means um, a sliver of something. Right. In English, we have it as well. It means it's for mica, which is a geological mineral. Mica are um, uh, like biotite and muscovite, which are shiny. Uh, biotite is a shiny black. Looks like it's plastic. Uh, and um, uh, bio and uh, muscovite is a shiny white color. Looks like a pearl color. They're really pretty, both of them. And they come in, they're actually called books. Right. And, and uh, geology major, um, <laughs> so yeah. the uh, they come in these. They're called books because when you actually get them out of a rock, it could be like usually a metamorphic rock, for example. There are these 
these they right. look like old style books or something with pages with leaves inside them and they're really cool and you, you can they have um they're easily cleaved they have very distinct uh cleavage in one plane where you can just break them apart and um they're called mica mica which is latin for a sliver of something and also wow. micari de, like the micari right in latin to fight each other is is the ching 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 the shining of the of the blades um and that and they also flash right to um a uh, mica yeah micari is like to Mikan. flash yes Mikan, the flashing of blades yeah. yes because i have to I remember that because um, when with our friend Stefano, when he had with, with the singing, that's actually one of the lines. Ciao, can... Stefano, se stai yeah. ascoltando. It's our, our Italian yes. friend and colleague, Stefano Vittori, translator of uh, several songs in Latin, including one we're working on now, Chris and I, with him, uh, performing uh, translation for Nightmare Before Christmas that we're, we're working on. So, um, uh, saluto to him. Sorry, you were saying. No, and I actually have the, um, the thing here. It's, you have things like, um, chiara, um, chiarare to chat, clarare. you have ipai, oh, I'm sorry, ipare to sob, um, mm. and then kekare to stammer. This is huh. different, right? And it's and you Absolutely. have buk, right, buka, which means um, cheeks, and then bikus. Yeah, it's it, it's it's really really interesting. And yes, here it is, mikus from the it's from is it from Mika. Uh, it's I'm not it's a variation. It said it's a variation of um of picus under the influence of Mika and the Greek. Ah, Mikos. okay. Well that's really cool. Um speaking of Greek, um Lepex uh Ogrotegos says Apollos uh hierismus apotinalada. Well uh here kiss you. Um I'm sorry, I'm speaking half ancient Greek. Uh here uh hi. Uh and uh, thank you very much. Uh, for for your comment, um, and going back a little bit, um, Isan Isan oh is that Isan Sik? Is that a Spanish name? Because Ramon is Spanish. Isan Sik. It looks almost like a Slavic name, but uh, let us know, Senor Ramon. Um, Want to pronounce your name right? Um, but uh, I'm curious uh, of the order in which you learned Romance languages. Did you, did you first learn um, uh, Latin? So what I, I first learned Italian. Uh, well in Florence, Italy. Then I got a hold of Familia Romana, wonderful book. I'm sure you've uh, heard of it. If not, then post a comment and we'll, someone will please post in the comment the link to my playlist and you know we can you can actually go get the book. It's fantastic. Um, and so I learned Italian, so I had conversational romance language. Um, and I was also studied a bit of French in college a bit before that, so I had some French background. So learned Latin to fluency. Um, went back to Italy to study Latin literature, so I had you know this kind of reinforced Italian Latin combination for myself. Continued with French. Um, I picked up a Spanish grammar book and I taught myself all the basics and just I have to this day a rather Italian Latin uh, Spanish, rather Italian <laughs> Spanish. So everybody knows that, that about my accent. So I need to learn Spanish, you know, really well. Uh, the Destinos program I particularly recommend. I don't. Uh, oh, I do have a link. So this. So uh, Destinos. Uh, for Spanish, it's fantastic. It's free, made in 1991, and they have the shoulder pads to prove it. Um, it is really, really good, and I do uh, do uh, recommend it. I put that uh, up here. Uh, in fact, I have a little article uh, I wrote about it on. Hold on, lucranieri.com. Go to my web of poorly designed websites. <laughs> no. They're not that bad. They're, they're okay. They're, they need a lot of work to look like they weren't made 20 years ago. But um, here is the link for everyone if you want to go check out what I have to say about this fantastic free program. This is how I learned Spanish, and it uh, is really, really good. Um, that's what I wanted to say about that. Uh, what, what uh, yeah, so the, oh, we had, Help me catch up here, uh, Chris. Did we miss any particularly interesting comments? Some more Greeks, which are cool. Uh, yes. Uh, let me see here. I think, I think that was one of them. As far as singing Psalm 150 in Latin, I have not memorized Psalm 150 in Latin, but I do read the language. And thank you, Mea Soror Faiga, esta adest etiam sponsors ellos. Salve Faiga. Oh, wonderful. And uh, Lukofos says, Filiapo Elada Lukie. Here. Hi. Yes. Uh, which and is, I, what I just said yeah, was that my, sis my, my sister just notified me that she was watching as well as her husband. Oh. Saying, hello. Oh, okay. Yes. Hel well, yes. Hello, all wonderful and most welcome family members who are here. Yes. Um, 
Oh, and uh, it's so it's his son. Uh, it's an Chich. It's an Chich. My son Chich Ram Ramon. I don't. Uh, you uh, wrote it here phonetically, but I'm still not sure if I'm doing it right. Isan Sich. Isan Sich. That would make sense uh, for a Western Slavic language, perhaps. Uh, I know that's pretty general. There's like eight languages that fit into that um, <laughs> uh, connection. But anyway, I'm sorry if I'm not saying it right. Isan Sich. Um, but, uh, anyway, uh, Alphonse says, uh, uh, yes. Oh, oh that's wait. interesting. Wait. Mm. Wow. Um, me, oh, me, yeah. Yeah. Cause in Latin it's, um, me yere or me yere, me yere, me yere, mm -hmm. and me Yeah. Mm. It's Proto-Indo-European. It's, it's a very old origin. Um, cool. All right. Well, uh, so this how did you go ahead, Chris? Sorry. No, no, go ahead. The question. How please. did you get into dance? Because in addition to being a, because um, we got you as Latin speaker, language uh, aficionado, computer science uh, maestro, and so the the stuff that shows that you're you're not, in fact, just a fantastic nerd. <laughs> right. You also dance extremely well. <laughs> how did, yeah, how did that come about? Why did you get interested um, in dance? I remember when I was growing up. I would see because the style of dance that I do is it's hip hop. It's a um, it's a combination of like animation. Uh, it's it's animation primarily, um, and what I remember growing up and I remember I don't know like Cuba Gooding Gooding Jr. and just seeing and like Chris Brown and seeing different people dance and I like their style of dance. Mm. Um, Did and, we dance on your Instagram account? I don't I I have one one video where I was dancing at a Sarsoteca actually. Um but and but I do need to upload but I have on my um my YouTube channel, not my Perno YouTube channel, but my main YouTube channel, I do have a lot more uh, freestyle videos uh -huh. um of me dancing and I can share a link of uh, at least one of those and I've been practicing as well. It's just it's it's an iterative process of you know making sure that I get better. But how I got into it, I started to, um, I really like that style. But I would be so nervous dancing in front of people. I remember one time I was with my cousins. I was at their house and they were dancing. All of them were dancing together, and they offered um, to to have me dance as well. And they offered to like turn their head around and to not watch me. And I still refused. And mm. um, But then one time when I was in, what was it? When I was in high school, yes, on my senior prom. Please do. I would love it. What are you and, responding um, to? They can't read it. Well, some can. I'm not sorry, everybody. Melanie. <laughs> Melanie, please. I Danza folkloric. Yes, folklorica. I would love to learn this because I actually wanted to learn Cueca <laughs> from Chile as well. But like um, when my senior prom, I decided, you know what, I'm 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 going to dance for the first time in in public, and so I Bravo. some people were were surprised actually. Then when I was in university, some other classmates um, were dancing at a event to sort of like introduce the university. We were all freshmen at the time, and I mm. danced with them. I decided to, and then I noticed that they would go to the gym and they would practice. Over time, I was I was the one who was just practicing in the gym. I guess they went someplace else, but I would I just kept doing it. I posted a video on uh on youtube for the first time on uh facebook and then i think i think what i danced to was a song called playing around before church starts by where is alex mm -hmm. that is the entire name no spaces no capital letters and it was great um well i, well, I like not that it was great i liked the process of dancing i, I like it it was really expressive and then um I started to get a little bit more into bachata and salsa. I still am not very th that good in salsa. I'm a little bit more comfortable in bachata. And at first, I didn't necessarily like the music style, but especially after from after going to Chile and exposing myself to more music, I was like, you know what? I really, really like this. And so mm -hmm. that's how it sort of evolved. And even when I was in Chile, I met some break dancers who were um, there. And so I was kind of uh, involved in that just a little bit. They actually had a workshop a few days ago, and I didn't actually sign up for it. And they were talking about how to combine the um, Mapuche concept of energy with dance. Mm. And Mapuche is like the uh, Native American tribe that was that is um, that 
was in Chile, the area that we would call Chile right now. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's really, really interesting. I never didn't actually see it, but I really, really enjoyed it. Um, what was mm. interesting is that when I was in one course that I was in, we had to, it was on Eastern history, um, East, uh, East Asian history. Mm -hmm. And we read a book describing Bushido. And we had to do a little project. The, the Japanese. Uh, yes. All right, Bushido. Yes. And so, the way, we were, which is the. Uh, uh, um, tell us what Bushido is. Bushido, it's, it's, it's basically like a sort of samurai lifestyle. I don't necessarily remember all of the right. details. Way of the, the warrior kind of thing. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And so, we had to figure out. So, we had to take a text, some sort of philosophy. Um, from the class and see how it applied to our lives. And so I decided to use Bushido, but with dance. And so there was a sort of way of combining it. Um, I remember one aspect of it that I covered in my presentation was I didn't want to necessarily um, embrace the idea that I could be better than people in dance because even with competition, I can get a little bit nervous. <laughs> And so it, um, so to me, I felt that it would be a bit more helpful to focus on a sort of level of politeness and mutual respect and not necessarily trying to show off because that's actually one of the big, even admittedly full disclosure, that can be even one of the temptations when it comes to me dancing is wanting to show off. And I notice almost, not even necessarily, not necessarily almost immediate, but, but I notice that it impacts my ability to dance. I become more scared than actually confident than if I'm just not fully present or worried about how it appears so much mm, absolutely yeah and uh uh well that, that's that's fantastic yeah i i've done like next to nothing i enjoy dancing i remember loving japan because my minimal middle school dance experience was sufficient to put me ahead of almost every japanese person. <laughs> <laughs> like try i had a uh of course um uh a girlfriend in, in japan and there was mm -hmm. one occasion where there was uh, an opportunity to dance at a um uh, a military function and uh, oh, yeah nice. and, and yeah and she just would not and I had to really like come on you know let's go go on and like you know like in me I just you know awkward you know whatever <laughs> nothing <laughs> in particular it's and, uh, but I, you know I just don't care but man they are just like absolutely not petrified um, and but. but uh, and that's actually one thing that's really, really fun. Um, I appreciated it a lot. The people who um, who even were patient with me, even when I was uh, dancing. Yes, integrity, respect, heroism, honor, compassion, sincerity, and do it. Yes, I remember now. I remember a lot of this, especially when it came to respect, compassion, uh, the sincerity, actually expressing mm. myself, the story of it. So yes, I, I, I yes. And um, I think the, what I, what I do appreciate is when there is just sort of a desire to just enjoy sort of yourself in that moment. And it's not necessarily mm. focused on trying to look a certain way or another. And uh, Sebastian, thank you so much. Um, and his Instagram account is amazing. What he does, uh, unbelievable. He takes um, all kinds of different ancient or old um, artwork pod pottery like ancient greek pottery or like the frescoes from Pompeii, and he cleans them up digitally so you look like you're seeing them just after they were painted they're wow. unbelievable and uh sebastian if you could uh i can't remember your instagram account off the top of my head but if you write it there i'll put it up for people to follow you because it is uh just true truly an art form to with such passion to restore these ancient works like you do and um and uh yeah they're really really amazing uh fantastic yeah so um well what what else did i have a I have a list of a list of topics oh, i'm in with topics we have which i'm glad we covered a lot of them sweet so what what's next as far as uh like languages and you know you and i are both into latin and ancient greek and you know what, what's your what's your next step is you gonna are you gonna concentrate on those more or another modern language and and how are you going to tackle that what i what i'm as far as my projects are concerned, or the next steps, I should say, um, I am working on a final project. I don't want to necessarily make any promise. It's still in its early stages, and I am working on it, mm -hmm. um, where I'm wanting to translate um, different songs. It's actually one of the primary ways that I practiced Latin at the beginning was I would translate songs that were like that I really, really liked um, into Latin, and that's what my one of my final projects for university is going to be. Um, I'll be translating those and then putting those out and I'll see how it works. I've um, 
incorporated different songs from both that are written originally in English and also in Spanish. I've translated both of those, the translated them um, in ways that sort of allow me to both render the language in the render the original song in Latin, but then also sort of explore the different reasons why I originally liked the song. So mm. I'm not just I'm not just translating the song. I'm wanting to translate in I'm wanting to incorporate into the translation the things that that song reminds me of. Um, mm. So I so for some people like I have a YouTube a YouTube account Pernox and I did a cover of Havana that I had translated into uh, which Latin. you can find on. Chris's uh, YouTube channel, Sutra Pernox Latin. Yes. And uh, and I'll put at least the link to the channel itself. Hey, you just passed 100 subscribers, so I think you can get a unique URL finally instead of this uh, long, terrible thing. <laughs> <laughs> but all of you in the uh, in the chat, if you come in the chat, you can go directly to it. Or if you search for Pernox, like looks like per, Pernox, Pernox in Latin, and you can find his, uh, where he has um, two renditions of uh, Havana. Uh, and also he responded to the push-up number challenge. Yes. And I think, and what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to be redoing that, um, that translation. And I'll be talking actually about my, for example, sort of exploring my relationship with Chile, with Valparaíso, then sort of trying to get a window into what my thoughts are, how connected do I feel to Chile as a result of my study abroad trip, because it's actually been something that's been on my mind for a little bit. So yes. Mm, yeah. Oh, well, Sebastian, wonderful. like like that translation too. Thank you. Yeah. Melanie asked, um, the next language to learn, uh, yeah, or get better at. For me, uh, to uh, if, uh, I've been well, there's only you know seven or eight that I have currently am working. <laughs> <laughs> which I, I say not because that's not bragging what that demonstrates is my lack of focus um, <laughs> uh, and so i'm interested in all of them but i mean the way you get uh and it's well you know to be a you know, polymath and anybody could be a polymath or at least to aspire to be polymathic uh or we certainly fall into that category as do a lot of our listeners we like a lot of different things right. you know we're not just you know, I'm. You know, we're not just Latin uh, speakers or computer scientists. You know, we're, we we do different things, and um, we uh, we enjoy them a lot. So, for me, um, Aleph with Beth, which is on YouTube, and Aleph with Beth, um, Beth and her husband um, Avraham, uh, they are amazing because they've learned biblical Hebrew to fluency, and they teach it in comprehensible input manner. Yeah, you know, their YouTube. Uh, dot com slash Aleph with Beth and I've uh, was uh, um, considering starting uh, some months ago about eight or so months ago a, a program um, for YouTube where I was going to kind of teach in a comprehensible input way based on um, on French in action which you should also all go and do French in action oh yeah I have an article about that as well on my uh, web page on my website, I'll let me open up uh, lucranieri.com uh, and get that up for people to look at if they're interested. So French in action is amazing because it's comprehensible input French. That is, you learn French just like the Destino Spanish. In fact, it's from the same Annenberg um, company where it was on like PBS and stuff like that. And each one of them both have 52 episodes, 30 minutes each, all in Spanish, all in French respectively. And uh, there, where is this? Here's the French one. So this is how to become fluent in French. Um, and uh, let's see, uh, put up that link there. So that's where I talk about it and have the link to it. But you can also Google it and go right to it. You don't have to go to my article on, um, but yeah, French in action is absolutely amazing. And uh, it's, um, um, and then that's what inspired, then I, I was, then I was going to, and then I got really busy and then I had to move across the country. And then I was at the same time, saw Aleph with Beth start and Aleph with Beth, um, uh, they, I've started finally getting the time to actually watch these and start learning Hebrew with them. Oh, they're amazing. And I learned so much from them from my own videos where I'm doing comprehensible input in Latin on Scorpio Martianus. And, uh, oh, they're so great. They're so animated. They're so professional. They're sound quality and video quality. So yeah, I mean, it makes learning, it makes the whole experience fun and entertaining. So even if you really just had never were interested in biblical Hebrew before, you will be because they're just that interesting. And the whole comprehensible input concept is inherently stimulating it makes you fall in love with the language i think because you get so right. 
Yeah, you get because if you go to be in a foreign country, and as long as you're not overwhelmed with you know people yelling at you, or suddenly you're in a foreign country, don't know the language, and you're in the police station, that's no fun, right? That's that's terrible. Um, but if you're in an environment where you get to be guided through it, and in, um, in a way where it's graded and you go step by step, it can be some of the most fun to be immersed like that because then you um, uh, you don't uh, you you just feel such an enjoyment. So even if you never cared about a particular language. If it's French or Spanish or Hebrew, in these comprehensible input examples I, I happen to share today, you will end up uh, just finding it fantastic. Now, some people are writing to me in Hebrew, but I'm very elementary in Hebrew. What did you say? Aleph, Beth, Bethit. Am I reading that right? Hold on. And then, Yafe, is that Yafe? Marcelo, I don't speak. <laughs> I don't know. Either. I started. That spread seemed like three episodes, but they're re they're amazing. They're really really good of Aleph with Beth. Um, so that's my next project. I want to finish those. I'm really interested in learning Arabic um, uh, as well. Um, uh, modern standard Arabic. Uh, go ahead. What do you got? No, that's actually uh, my a friend of mine who speaks Latin. She wanted me to learn Urdu, and that's actually what I think of the next Ooh. one. And then also cool. after that, uh, Malagasy because nice. I have some ancestry from Madagascar. And so, really? Fantastic. Yeah. And they I don't know anything did. about that language. What's Madaga It's called uh, Mad uh, Madagascar? Malagasy. Malagasy, sorry. In the language of Madagascar, you said? Yes. I don't know anything about it. Tell us. It is sort of, it's sort of Asiatic, because um, when the island was first populated, at least from what I've um, researched, it was populated by pe by some people from Indonesia and also from the mainland of Africa at almost around the same time, and so there's a lot so there's a lot of mixing that can come on that 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 comes in the island as far as like Asiatic features goes and the language itself, if I'm not mistaken, if I'm saying this correctly, is Austronesian, so it's ah, more right. so and so is it connected the, with Dravidian um, at all? The, the which is a language in southern India language group. I mean, I'm not entirely certain. I oh, yeah, have to yeah, look that know. up. Go ahead. But sorry. Go ahead. Um, but it's sort of like Asiatic sounding in the sense that there's a lot of open vowels. It only has four of them. Um, mm. And you also, it uses a lot of prefixes instead, it uses a lot of prefixes in for, instead of, um, in order to modify nouns. And the tense system is a lot, is, a, is simplified in the sense you only have past, present, and future. And you don't necessarily conjugate in the same way. So you would attach um, pronouns to mm. the word itself and so it's it's really really interesting i haven't learned a whole lot of it there's not a lot of documentation on it but i see videos of people speaking it every now and then i'm like you know this would actually be pretty cool to learn too this would be learned this would be really uh, absolutely. good but then, but then also a lot of the people there speak french so i'm like okay so that's another one so we're just going to learn every dialect of Latin. <laughs> um, everyone go go for it i, I want to learn every italian dialect or language as they're, they're called uh, and, uh, and and Marcelo uh, tells us that uh, Yofi, which is what's on screen now, Yofi means nice. So cool. Awesome. Bye bye. Yeah, bye bye. Yeah. Wow, that would be great. Yeah, I want to learn every language. And that's the sad thing. There's literally, like, even if you had every possible opportunity, everything open for you it just you know you could never get there but it's fun to aspire to and what does knowing a language really even mean yes and that's that is one of the biggest what, things what's for what is for you what's your definition knowing a language is be, knowing a you language... studied you studied ancient greek and you can converse in some ancient greek i know because i hear you every week um oh no not uh, every week I, I don't know how to i i, I am i have no idea how to I only listen sometimes. I don't necessarily speak. You utter sentences in ancient Greek, but my point is that for you, and this is this is sort of my thing, like that I want to ask about because this is almost personal estimation and philosophy in a way, personal how you see yourself. Um, you have studied some ancient Greek, for example, but you don't list that, right? Other people might. Why? Oh. Why? Why would you? Why would you? Like, what's your what's your level? Some people might say like they might speak. Latin, like you and I can speak Latin, but they would say like, oh, you know, I'm not really at, at a level yet where I'm comfortable. Or maybe they would have a level far below us and say Spanish and say they know Spanish, you know? And so, so what's, what, what is their determination there for you personally, or how should people determine it? For me, I determine it as, do I feel comfortable expressing myself to other speakers? Native because or foreign? Native, mm. native. 
And the reason why I say that is because for me, it goes back to the whole idea of knowing a language is mm. um, it, 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 it kind of reminds me of it was knowing a language isn't necessarily something that can be achieved. But I remember when I was in um, when I was in Chile, I was reading I was a part of this. I was one of the courses that I was taking was the mysteries and traditions of the Rapa Nui culture. Rapa Nui is the island, Easter Island is what we would know it as. Yes. And so there was actually an article that I was reading about how there is a shift of the people of Rapa Nui who are speaking Spanish now. And this is something that has been going on in like the 20th century because it was prohibited for them to speak their language. And so for a long period of time, there was sort of like this syncretic speech pattern that was going on. Syncretic speech basically means they were sort of mixing the language. And then now the newer generation of kids are primarily Spanish speakers, but they use what is called like Rapa Nui Spanish in that they will, you know, interject different words. And they and so there was a particular point where the author of this article was saying, she was saying that we conventionally think of language as being a homogenous entity, like knowledge of a language as being homogenous, when in fact it's not. Language itself is not monolithic. And we as English speakers do not necessarily know every variety of English, not even necessarily in our own context as a country, because they're like even as with you being in the military, the way that you use English is going to vary from the way that I use it as a civilian. The social uh, absolutely and, right the social circles that we're circles that we navigate are going to be different. And mm -hmm. so when I so, but I still consider myself fluent because I can express myself comfortably with native speakers of the language. And I think that if that is what it means, it means that I'm I can hold a conversation in the language about something that's emotionally salient to me. So with Spanish, I feel like I can do that a little bit more, um, a, a lot better. So I would say I'm comfortable saying that I know Spanish. With Latin, I'm approaching that point, but I don't think I'm totally there yet. And so that's actually something I'm going to be doing. That's actually one of the purposes of this project. A lot of the songs that I'm going to be translating, the things that they're hearkening back to are, are very personal things for me. And so mm. it's also an experiment. And how do I talk about things that are near and dear to my heart? Not necessarily all of them are the most revealing things in the world, but some of them in a certain sense are. Um, one of them touches on the reason why I sort of muse about um, the connection between Spanish and Latin. Others talk about um for example my connection to chile or even uh, just a variety of things and so mm. what i want to do is practice actually expressing myself in the language with portuguese i feel a little bit more comfortable writing things but <laughs> even then it's it's i can express myself with a certain degree of fluency only because i know spanish a lot right but i don't it's necessarily a lot of skill transfer yeah. yeah. And, and just, as we saw when, when I got to be on uh, Norbert's uh, Fantastic Eco Linguist uh, channel and the people who saw me speaking Latin to an Italian and a Brazilian and a Mexican who do not know Latin, except, you know, they speak their own native languages. Now, not only can the three of them communicate with one another, even though um, they've minimally studied the respective Spanish, Italian and Portuguese languages, they can and they speak just in their native language well that demonstrates that hey what we define with distinct barriers as these national and um multinational languages italian spanish portuguese maybe they're not quite so uh there if you can have because mutual intelligibility is a, is often what people say oh that's what defines a language um and that's kind of what you're saying too if i can express myself i've between mutually myself and this other person whose native language i'm trying to speak oh we have we've reached mutual intelligibility, thus I know the language. Yeah, conversational fluency, that's how I would put it too. And then if you see these people who, they don't really know each other's languages, they kind of do, um, but uh, not like, you know, and they didn't know Latin, and they yet they <laughs> can understand it. So is it all, in, I mean, it's no one would call them the same language, but maybe the definition, which is vague, inherently vague, what a language is supposed to be, is, because if it's mutual intelligibility, well, maybe it's not. Because then if you have other things that are considered languages that are highly mutually intelligible to the point of obviously being the same language, like um, Swedish, Norwegian, and Danish, or uh, Croatian and Serbian and so forth, uh, Urdu and Hindi, um, and mm -hmm. the what's important there, and, I, and then for anyone who's listening who speaks those languages and is angry either way or the other, I apologize because I'm not trying to, um, <laughs> to diminish or overemphasize something that ought not to be emphasized. As far as differences go, because I don't know, because that's so much. Because it's um, they say a language is a dialect with a navy or an army, um, and um, and that's a that's you know a big big deal. Like because when you have languages which are clearly 
you know, they're di- no more different than British and American English, which everyone in the world will say, yeah, that's the same language. Um, or at least most people, depending on, you know, we have strong dialects depending right. on where you go, but, but for the most part, they're, you know, and you have the same level of intelligibility between countries which are right next to each other and they call them different languages. And it's, I just find that really interesting. And I think Webster, when he was his American yes. Yes, yes. English dictionary, they were going for like leaning towards creating a new American language, kind of like when the French and their whole enlightenment period, they were coming up with new systems of measure, like the metric system, but a new time system, metric time, metric calendars, and all sorts of crazy nonsense. Some of which was worth adopting, like the metric system, and others which were not, (laughs) obviously. Uh, Yeah. That's that's exactly, um, because a lot of it has more to do with a person's perception of themselves. And this is where we get into the whole thing of like when it comes to even with interacting with native speakers and um, and what is correct. This, this sort of overlaps a little bit with what is considered correct. So when we're talking about how do you speak a language, you're also talking about how do you use correct things in a language. And depending on where you are, like this is something that you'll get involved with in different countries. Um, in Latin America, you'll have, you might use a word that means something completely different in a different Mm. culture. So you have the word uh, or cachai, which means to understand. It actually comes from the word to catch in English. Captar, captare. Wait, it comes from English? Not from Latin, captare? Cachare. Cachar, this means it comes from the word catch. Oh, because catch is ultimately from Latin too, from captare, from capare. Well, then it always works. But but (laughs) but But then it's that word, which means to understand in Chilean Spanish, means something completely different in Peru. And I made that mistake earlier with a friend of mine who was from Peru. What does uh, cachar mean in Puerto Rican and Spanish? I have no idea. Got a, but in Peru, something... it, but in Peru, in Peru? it means futuere. Oh my, well, look yes. at that. Um, and, but no, and that's... <laughs> ah. but that's yeah. But yeah. um, this is the, that's a Latin um, profane word, by the way. You'll have to look it up. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah. It, but it's but there's also that's fascinating. But it's but when it comes yeah. to what was it? What was that uh, point of? Oh geez. Oh, when I was reading that article on one of the things that I'm doing for one of my translations is it's called strategic bivalent Spanish, and mm. one part of the this is actually a strategy that was used by people like Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz, uh, mm. bilingual poems, for example. They would mix Latin and Spanish, mm. but this and they would do it with other languages too, Portuguese and Latin, Italian and Latin, even between Italian and French, so that you mm. would be speaking the same language at both languages at the same time. And this was this was developed particularly in Spain during the 15th and 16th centuries. And it was almost Mm. as a way of sort of legitimizing Spanish's connection to Latin as sort of like the proper heir of the Roman Empire as opposed to Italy. But the interesting thing about this is that this was the way that people tried to, in their erudite circles, prove that Spanish did come from Latin. But a lot of people did not like this. You mean it's um, not from Punic? It's not from Carthaginian language? No, I'm, I'm kidding because have you heard of this? This yes. um, professor, professor, yeah. uh, professora in Spain who yeah, has you, you heard? Yeah, I, I, I would actually, love. I started to watch the video and it was like because I want it because you know I wanted. I to couldn't hear get through arguments. the first ten minutes. <laughs> 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 the video is for those out of you. You can you can find it's um, it's this is clearly an intelligent person. Um, but the theories that she's professing are not viable. The idea is that. The language of Spain, of Spanish, is in fact not fun- fundamentally from Latin, but is fundamentally from Carthaginian, that is Phoenician or Punic language, of the, um, which is a Semitic language. It's not even part of the Proto-Indo-European family or the Indo-European family of languages, and yet it's somehow fundamental. But I mean, you can just take any sentence from Spanish and then see the Latin version of it of and latin of different periods and other romance languages and they just you have these lines up of, of grammatical conjugations so it's it's hunting for things uh that are barely there it is fascinating actually what's more interesting is how little substrate of visigothic or uh other um uh, what else was there um punic or even there was even some greek colonies in spain but almost none of that survived into standard um modern spanish no doubt there was some influence but it's uh it's just it's it's crazy. It kind of blows my mind how how little there is. And yet, I was thought of another example because people assume like, ah, well, you you have 
a mixing of cultures, intermarriage and all those things. And genetic evidence also demonstrates that obviously all of Europe isn't genetically Italian. It's mixed with all kinds of things because there were people who existed in Iberia, for example, before the Italian Romans got there to conquer them. And yet there's almost nothing of the languages that came came before. There are isolated pockets like Basque, but the Basque region was, of course, the only place the Romans didn't actually bother conquering because in the mountains, they're like, eh, I don't want to go up there. You know, we uh, have the Alps. It's fine. It's like, oh, it's like, you know, it's yeah. just, that's just too much. They're like, ah, we want the coffee break. I'm sorry, Italians. Out there. <laughs> but that's you, actually... you, but I wouldn't say that if, if your small town city halls weren't closed from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. for lunch. So, which happened to me <laughs> 2005 <laughs> in my grandfather's hometown. But go ahead, Chris. Sorry. I was, no, it's, was... it's fine. And what, what one thing yeah. that was really interesting is that a lot of uh, Spanish thinkers at the time, Spaniards, they were like, I don't like that we're connecting this language to Latin because it was more of like a biblical perspective of, you know, our language was one of the lang fundamental languages that was created after the Tower of Babel. You know, that's this is and but you find but I thought that was really interesting because it mirrors how we on the American continent can sort of like try and distance ourselves from at least the Europeans who who sort of gave us the language that we speak mostly. And I thought that that was really interesting that you see that with Spain regarding Latin, which ultimately is um, the parent language. And so there was this brief point where it was talking, and I think that you covered this in a video about how the ecclesiastical pronunciation of Latin and the classical pronunciation, mm -hmm. restored classical pronunciation of Latin occurred, is that the relationship between Spanish and Latin is more of like a spectrum. And it's mm. really just sort of a continuation of the same Latin tradition. It's just that our cultural perspective of where the break actually is, is what creates this sort of this idea of a definitive boundary line. Mm. And this is where you get this idea. This is where you get this, this interesting pattern where you'll have people who speak Spanish. And this is something that bothered, not bothered, but sort of fascinated me. They speak Spanish. They should be able to know the relationship recognized Latin, their connection with oh, the Latin They see the differences language. more profoundly. Right. Some, some of them. Others are, you know, depends. Right. Well, and, and so it's, it's uh, well, no, no, it's, and it's like on. sometimes mm -hmm. you'll sometimes see, you'll feel people who see people who are like, oh, this is old um, or it's scary. But it's, it's so but it's but it's the same perception. There's that idea of being culturally distanced from that parent language. It's not seen as being the same thing. Right. Well, um, and I was thinking, too, because uh, there are similar uh, theories about um, uh, Romanian being fundamentally not a romance language. But I mean, you just you just can't you find all these origins. And some of the theories are like, ah, there's another Proto-Indo-European language there, Thracian or, or Dacian or Thraco-Dacian, which is actually the substrate, not just the substrate, but the fundamental language. And then Latin just kind of added to it in the same way that we understand English to be a Germanic language, despite the huge amount of Latin. But if you look at the grammar of, of how the conjugations work, and you can see that they clearly are evolved from Latin in the exact, almost like you have this exact same things happening in Italian as happened in, in Romanian, which suggests either they did were doing the same thing at the same time when they were in the, during the Roman empire, those Italians who came to settle in Dacia or wherever they came from, which was mostly Dacia or mostly Italy, um, potentially, or it's, it's the connections are irrefutable. You find a couple of words here and there. It's, I mean, you can, tease yourself into it. So, and it's, and I think it's a, something that's worth looking into. How many substrate words do exist? Um, however, it's because if you look at, a, you know, true Creoles, like uh, French Creole or wh wherever you find these fantastic Creoles, these true mixes of uh, languages. And I believe uh, the definition between pigeon and a Creole, and uh, if, if Rafael Turijano were here, he'd help me out. But a pigeon is where you get two groups of people who are together who have to kind of try to figure out each, other, each other's language and it's this bizarre lingua franca mix. But then if you have children who then start speaking the pidgin, that becomes a Creole, becomes a native language at that point. I think that's something like that. I don't, I, for, now that I say it, it sounds totally wrong to me. Someone look it up and tell me because I don't remember. But anyway, it's very <laughs> interesting. So those are true mixes, right? And those happen. Right. Like Old English and Old Norse merging in, in England to create Middle English or the foundation of Middle English plus Norman French on top of it, changing the grammar and everything. But the, um, so you expect seeing those things, ah, the Romans must also have mixed with 
people in, say, Iberia or uh, Dacia to the point where this there's no way this could be mostly or Latin foundation. But then I, I was thinking about, because you mentioned the Americas, how much of um, the languages of people who were here before um, using the technical Latin term Aboriginal, otherwise called sometimes Native American or American Indian, if it's in the United States, or uh, Amerindian, these various terms for the, um, the groups of people with their hundreds of different languages. How can, uh, surely those languages must survive into American English or to um, Canadian English or Canadian French or to in the, um, uh, in the Spanish or Portuguese of uh, the Americas. But to my knowledge, not only does American English have very few terms, if not geographical like Mississippi or Ohio, or whatever uh, geographical term, but almost nothing grammatically, and also almost nothing, very few vocabulary terms. And could, what about Spanish? I don't. I just don't remember what. I know there's mu much more there than in English. I think. Do you, that can you think of anything? I can't think of anything off the top of my. Or probably chocolate, chocolate, mm. <laughs> chocolate, chocolate mm. is actually one word. But um, the, but other than that, I haven't. I know that in. Me Mexico, there's probably a lot more Nahuatl, but I think uh, Melanie could probably confirm that a bit, a bit more. Speak to that maybe a bit more, a bit better than I could. Um, but yes, that that does happen. It's yeah, it, yeah. It does, but I just can't think of anything at, at the time. Very the little, right? We don't right. and and um, and then I think about the the Romans. Now, I probably we have more equivalency between technology and power relationship that the peoples living in, say, the tribal peoples living in Gaul and Iberia and Dacia were probably more equal in measures of power and society um, uh, to each other um, than, say, the European powers when they the, the colonists came to the Americas because they had such a, um, they had the advancements not just of the ancient Romans, but another thousand years worth of technology, uh, including gunpowder, which is a huge game changer, as well as um, all of the societal or the social structures and so society things that they had created, these uh, hierarchies, right? Hierarchies right. like, say, a military, for example. Um, it takes a military effort to a campaign to do something. And obviously, you have uh, conquistadores in uh, the Americas. You have uh, American colonization. United States American colonization, I mean, um, the British colonies, and so anyway, and the French, they all have, I think that relationship dynamic is even um, greater than there was for um, the, um, uh, compared to the Aboriginal peoples of the Americas and these European colonists. And thus, the languages that were spoken by European colonists are um, so completely dominant, carrying like legal structures and power systems that those Aboriginal languages have had very little influence. And then comparing that to ancient Rome, which we know was the was the only, you know, game in town, if you will, at least in the in the area. I mean, there was ancient G Egypt and in Greece, but they were so well organized compared to everyone else. And to good or ill, obviously the Romans, as well as colonists, uh, wherever we can uh, calculate their evils and uh, and and sins <laughs> with all right. kinds of, of no, horrifying but... statistics. I'm not trying to justify these acts, but I'm just trying to like linguistically. Why on earth would American English have nothing? And I get from Aboriginal languages, and that would seem to be uh, because of power and influence. And thus, and thus, comparing that to Romanian, why does Romanian and Spanish, where they have almost nothing of these languages, and yet there's so much Germanic in French and Italian. Yeah, because Germanic peoples, tribes took over after the Roman Empire fell. I'm I'm done. Sorry. Go, you wanted you want no, to No, that's actually one thing that I was even a point earlier is that one of the testaments, because sometimes it's very difficult to, or for me it would be difficult to conceptualize the power of the Roman Empire. And then one thing that came to my mind uh, maybe like a year or two ago is like if you consider just how mutually intelligible all of these romance languages are. 2000 years after the fall of the empire that right. gives you a good picture of how of how dominant this the this, mm. this people group was and how um effective again like to use your term to good or for ill it was mm. it, it it was still a very you can imagine just how tight that control was and it's it's something that is it, I guess to use sort of like the the more classical sense of this word terribilis, terrible in the sense of being both 
um, awe-inspiring, but then also scary. Absolutely. Yeah, terrifying. Absolutely. Yeah, and uh, Tiberiu Salve, uh, um, by the way, uh, he uh, asked if you had a channel. Yes, search for Pernox Latin. He hasn't uh, doesn't have enough subscribers yet. So in order to make a, a um, personalized I URL, I you did? I do. I do. I sent it on the, uh, there's this private chat. If you, what? I just made it. I claimed it. Oh, you did while we're talking? Oh, man. Yes. Well I am multitasking. Well, let, well, we we are we are some polymathic multitaskers. Po we're polytaskers. That's what we are. There we uh, go. <laughs> there we go. Okay, let me amend that right here. Okay, and share that to our uh, chat so people can subscribe to you immediately, which would be fantastic. Good. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, everybody, for subscribing to, to Chris, because then... You'll uh, make more stuff, which we want, Craig, Chris. What do yes, you mean? I just want to say I do want to be careful. Let me see here because I think I accidentally didn't change it. I, wait, did I? Oh, wait, it does work. Okay, never mind then. This ah, all right, okay. good. Well, I, I mean, if the computer gro programmer hadn't done it right, then I would have been concerned, <laughs> just a little bit concerned. But you did without, but yes. and you at holding a difficult conversation about power struggles, linguistic evolution, and creoles all at the same time. <laughs> so. And dance. <gasps> yeah. This is the cross that I bear. No, but it's, it's, I, I really do enjoy this process. And then also, even um, when it comes to that computer stuff, the most recent discovery that I was making as far as computer terms is for the nerds who might be watching this and who might know anything about class structures. Um, mm. Are you familiar with this, Luke? Well, uh, which thing? A class? What about class structures? A class in, I've made a huge jump, a huge jump, uh, forgive me. Quantum leap, man, let's do it. Yes, um, the- um, Quantum computing. Exactly, someone brought it up. So now this is how it's going full circle. Um, the, when it comes to like class structures, one of the things that with programming, you have like a list of instructions and then you have like these big objects. And so mm. this one thing that I was fascinating was like figuring out how to actually do that. Um, mm. But I can revisit that later. When it comes to these power structures, um, that's one of the things that is that I've noticed even when it comes to even the comment sections for some of these videos. And it's sometimes something that I almost anticipate encountering um, even as I progress into Latin. There's this idea of how do you reconcile the idea of learning the language of an empire? Because we can't necessarily take away the implications of empire and then we're learning the language of it. And one of the reasons why it's even important for us to learn or why we value it is partially because of the influence of that empire. And I know that we've oh, discussed this utterly. as well. Utterly. Oh, yeah. yeah and you, I, you and I, and I have I, talked about this. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. And this, and that's one of the sort of the concepts about um, the Quirites that I kind of like. And I, when, I re, when I think that I'm grateful about when I learn Latin is that a lot of the phrases that are sort of wrapped up in the cultural um, I don't know, wardrobe of like, of all this pomp and circumstance that revolves around like Latin and Latin expression, when you actually know the language, it's mm. very, very normal. I remember when I was first learning, when we first actually met, um, close to that er those early days, you were telling me that, you know, like when it comes to Latin poetry, a lot of people think that it's very grandiose, but it's also, but it's very, very simple, very conversational. And I've noticed that even reading it myself. And so that's one thing that I have noticed about a lot of the, I guess the superiority complex that might be assumed that you adopt when it comes to Latin, it's not necessary because you start to realize a lot of this is just very conversational, very simple, straightforward stuff. But even then, like talk about even like this whole Quirites thing. I know you've been uh... pushing it. <laughs> yeah. No, I've, I've seen people use it. I'm grateful for I it. Do I do too. It. Yeah, well, uh, and then I'll give a quick thing on, on that. Of course, I, I put it up here uh, just because I... It's sort of because we uh, this the term of us Latin speakers, and let's extend it to ancient Greek speakers too, um, because I think that's that's just uh, Lorenzo Valla or Laurentius Laurentius Valla of um, uh, the Renaissance humanist Italian humanist, and he has uh, really interesting books. And when one of the um, Exordia, what's Exordium in English? introductions to one of his <laughs> his uh, <laughs> books he talks about the pleasure of speaking english less on any given day than latin as you start to forget your english it's really fun um and people are asking too in the chat like what's you know your best language is english 
Um, but followed by Latin, actually, my Latin has definitely gotten more comfortable than my Italian because I don't use Italian nearly that much, but I use Latin as much as I can. So, um, which is a, a fun, a fun thing. And just, it just happens when you spend years on it, just <laughs> trying to speak in it, you know, and getting to teach really cool, intelligent people who already speak Latin. It's like, oh, wow, this is great. So, you know, you get to, get to really, um, have fun with it. But, um, in his Exordium, the one of his books, Lorenzo Valla talks about, the um what he calls quirite so it's any people who can speak latin um and why and that name really um hit it for me because that's in livy livy talks about the origin of the name quirites whereupon and i have this video on scorpio martianos if you haven't seen it it's um i have it um pinned for returning visitors um and uh the rome roman history and actual, the actual Roman history and legend and myth are all filled with horrible acts from Aeneas abandoning Dido to go found, you know, the civilization of Italy and uh, to Romulus, the rape of the Sabines, all the way through every, everything, like there's all these horrible things. But, but really that um, inception, even conception of Rome itself is the rape of the Sabines. Well, what that leads to is not, you know, we, we people kind of get, they think of, you know, that beautiful statue that's in, in Florence and in the, um, at the uh, Loggia in the, um, uh, right there in, in the Piazza, where, where you see, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, this, this um, seminal uh, act of what Rome is. All they were was, cause how did Rome start? According to legend, Romulus founded it after killing his twin brother Remus, by the way, like Cain and Abel, which is, you know, not, I don't think God looked too fondly on that. If I remember reading <laughs> Genesis, right, that wasn't a good. So, and then the Romans are retelling a very similar story. Well, what does Romulus do after that? He needs people to occupy a city, so he grants asylum to every uh, criminal, every worst possible person in Italy or in the vicinity of Latium, for sure. And those are the, those are the people who inhabit uh, the new city of Rome. And then they try to build their civilization. It's like we. Rome needs women. What do we do? And so they uh, end up um, convincing uh, their the the neighboring city is Cures, uh, Cures, and the Sabines live in Cures. And so they um, they say, all right, Sabines from Cures, come to our uh, our games and to have uh, festivals and you know whatever. And they they do. And then at one point, Romulus gives just like in uh, where Family Guy does the imitation of Return of the Jedi, where they go na 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 na. No, no, like like uh, Luke Skywalker yeah. uh, to to uh, Lando, Lando nods to Leia, and they all like. And then, oh yeah, uh, and then uh, it was on the on the barge on on uh, Java's barge and Return of the Jedi, and then uh, it's like that Romulus does that apparently, according to Ovid in his um in one of his poems in the um Ars uh, Amandi or Ars, yeah Ars Amandi, great funny book. Um, and uh, <laughs> this is not you know that funny of a scene, but. Then it's like the not is, and they all, all the Roman are go and go get, get they each get a Sabon woman, and then it's just described that they're crying, they're weeping, you know, it's it's horrible, it's it's awful, and it's it's um uh it's not great, right? And then after that comes Romulus, and he comes, and this is Ovid's description of him. He's coming, say, you know, all every uh, all right, ladies, you know, be calm. I know this is not a great situation, but it's what we're in now. It's just like, oh my god, really, you know, and this is what he's what Romulus is, is saying right, to them. Like how so we're going to just like downplay this. <laughs> this yeah, but yeah, and exactly. But no, go ahead. And, no, and then the um, and then the and the Roman men are depicted as being very kind and sweet at this point, and saying, "Look, I know this is not what you want or expected, but you know, let's try to you know make the best of this." Okay, we fast forward a year, um, and the Sabines have gathered their strength. Sabine men, who were of course kicked out after the games, they've gone back to the city, and the fathers and brothers of these women come to make war on Rome to get their uh, daughters and sisters back. Um, and then they're about to clash. The great two, you know, there's this beautiful painting, which I might be able to find too, actually. Um, Sabine War painting. Um, and, uh, oh, good. Thank you, internet. God, do I love the internet. Um, and this, uh, let's see if I can get a good sized image of it. Uh, oh, look at that. Gosh, the internet is fantastic. Um, okay. Um, so let me share my screen here. Um, application window share this one. Okay. Let's see how this appears. 
All right, that's not too bad. Um, so this painting, which um, uh, we see here, why can I not remember the painter? I apologize. Someone tell me the painter's name. Um, so <laughs> what happens then is as the Sabines on the right, the Romans on the left, the Sabines are about, they're about to all start killing each other. But then the Sabine women intercede. They run in between the two lines of troops and they hold up their babies. You see this, this, uh, you know, she's brightly illuminated here, this figure in the middle, you know, Sabine man over here, Roman over here. And, uh, and the little babies and children, the newborns and everyone who have been part of this, they stand in the middle and say, do not do this. Father, brother, husband, don't do this because we're now linked uh, brother and father. This is your, these are your sons-in-law now. This is your son-in-law and husband. This is your father-in-law and brother-in-law. We can't do this. It doesn't, it's already basically too, in a way it's too late is what the message is here. And, um, it's, uh, you know, so it's out of some, what happens is that um, it's kind of a, a power of the divine feminine, I think is what's meant to be understood here. I'm, I'm not, you know, I don't sufficiently well educated in, in the artwork um, to understand, but I, I take the message of here we have, because um, Venus, Venus is not only the goddess of love, but the symbol of peace, as opposed to Mars, who's an agent of chaos in kind of a primordial way, right? So instead of chaos and death, taking and accepting um, what happened in the past, which can't be changed and turning it into something amazingly good, which was an alliance. From there, the Romans and the Sabines decide, okay, we're not gonna do this. We're not gonna go to war. We'll make an alliance. Uh, is that, does that justify what the Romans did? I don't think it does. It's just a way of saying we can't undo the past, unless of course you have an infinity gauntlet, in which case you can't. Um, uh, that that would be the only only way to do it. Uh, but the, so then, what happens is uh, the Rome, Romans and the Sabines um, create one nation. They decide to move the capital to Rome, but and now they're they're going to be all Romani at this point. But they decide, let, hey, let's even though we were because maybe Rome was the more powerful city at this point. Let's just assume, and that's why they decided to move the capital there. But like, wait a minute, Sabines who live in Cures. You, we're called Romani and you're called Quirites. Let's just all be Quirites. We'll all be Romani, we'll all be Quirites. So Romani becomes the more Mars-like, chaos, war-like name of the Romans, the Romani, the ancient Romans as we think of them. Whereas Quirites is what meant um, public citizens or even private citizens, people who aren't out there making war, but internal to the Roman kingdom, then the Republic and the empire was Quirites, used by Cicero, you've seen his speeches. It just means Romans, Quirites. Um, but it means Romans at peace instead of Romans at war. Um, and so out of out of that inherently wicked and evil act, people make the best of it and they decide to not um, return, um, you know, uh, and something wicked with something mortal and deadly and um, very interesting. Um, and that may be why it was appreciated and as a symbolically by uh, the painter who may have been inspired by Christian ideas as well, or iconography that, you know, is an idea of you're turning the other cheek and so forth. And, and I don't know, I don't know enough about any of those things to truly comment. I'm just kind of seeing things that I'm, I'm I recognize. Then the other part too, is that what happened with Rome and Greece, Rome conquered Greece, but then there's the Horus line, which is um, civilized Greeks conquered its barbaric um, victor or something like that. I'm trying to remember the English translation, but, uh, and that's, that again, Greece ends up pass, ends up uh, civilizing Rome after it becomes incorporated into it. So that Rome has become Rome Empire. It becomes just as Greek as it is Roman. So this all gets back to what do we teach our students if we're teaching Latin? How much do we teach them about the obvious wickedness of individuals and uh, parts of society in Rome? What is it wrong to um, venerate these works of art and literature from this ancient past? when the people who, who built them, much as uh, you know, what Washington DC, as we know, most of those famous buildings were built by slaves, especially the White House in particular and others. Um, and this is a doubly true for everything in ancient Rome, no doubt. Even though the designers were, um, were free men, um, uh, probably. What, um, what does that mean? Can we then, is it okay for us to appreciate things that came out of a society which falls so below our standards of acceptance in this century. So that's the introduction to another two hour period, but it, right. no, and, uh, it, what, what do you have to say about that? 
<laughs> no, no, it's it's what you're talking uh, about is it's not an irrelevant yeah. point because I think that one of the problems is that you can run into um one of two spectrums. We either venerate the past too much or we or we malign it so much to the degree that we forget how much those evils are present in us. I think that one of the biggest lessons that we can learn is that the, is that humanity has not necessarily changed all that much from Rome. Mm. So a lot of the, this, this is one of the things that I like when I read about Seneca, when I read Seneca and some of his letters, a lot of what he says speaks to issues that I have now, like even when he talks about how do you face death? How do you sort of uh, engage with this idea of hope and fear? And so when we talk about learning the ancient language of Latin, when we address that that question, it's not irrelevant to think about the the discussion of power. But I think that especially for people who want to study the language, you begin to understand those power dynamics themselves in a lot more color when you're actually studying them in the language because you're forced to actually embrace that mindset in order to understand what the implications of all of these words are within their within all of these forms of literature. So in a way, it's not something that you should shy away from. It is something that you have to directly address and then put in contrast with our modern mores. But even then, we take it a step further and understand that the Romans are not like devil children in the sense that we are angelic because in as much as culture and language is not homogenous, neither is ours. And so we talk about modern mores as if we have somehow left behind the evils of the past and these mm. things keep cropping up. And so there's a certain level of of almost humility that comes into play. And I think this is even something that even the pandemic teaches us because, I mean, how many times has this been compared to the plague? But I think that therein lies something that's fundamental that we have to understand. When we think about, because I remember when I would think about the plague when I was younger, it's like, wow, they were so unsanitary. And I'm so glad I live in the 21st century. But there's a certain level of arrogance that comes with that as well, that humans have somehow reached this, I guess, terminal velocity, so to speak, in our evolution, where we are the best, we are the ultimate, we are the farthest and the best that will be. And that's what every modern age has believed itself to be, only to be proved wrong by the next. And this is something that I think that we can learn from Roman history. So it's not necessarily a direct way of saying, well, why learn the language when you understand mm. how much it's connected to empire? But I think that's precisely the point. Are Spanish In and English any less connected to such imperial things where uh, not just... And and, yeah. Assuming, you know, of course, the yeah, inherent negatives yeah. of empires and not their positives. But yeah, and that's and that's what I think one thing that we have to understand is that when it comes to empire, we have to one hand, the, the only way that we're going to actually see and really appreciate the gravity of how wrong that past was is by looking at it. And then the second part is that we mm. can't distance ourselves from the fact that we sometimes can engage in these very same behaviors. Like you you get sort of a, an understanding of this, even in terms of the word for woman in latin and this is sometimes Femina or mulier. and and i've seen this uh i've seen at least one discussion of this with mulier coming from ultimately the word mollis which means soft and you get this idea of how has it how does that translate into the cultures that rome conquered and how they treat women you you see well i mean hold on i have caesar's gallic wars here somewhere but in the first line or one of the first paragraphs, he says that the the Belgians and the uh, Helvetians are among, or the Belgians in particular, are among the, the the toughest of the Gauls because they didn't have the effeminata, the effeminated, if you will, um, mores mm -hmm. of the Gauls who lived in um, Provincia and Provence in what's now southeastern France, because they were connected to the civilizing, feminizing effect of this of um, Roman civilized you know, culture. And thus they were furthest away and therefore less effeminati and therefore tougher or stronger, more masculine. It's right. Clearly, yeah, there's a lot of bias in there. And so, the, yeah. and so those, and that's one of the things is that where we have to say that we can see these things translating even into the in even into our um modern languages. It's not something that we've distanced ourselves from. And so mm. I think that even that etymological root, it it provides a very concrete example of an attitude that we can see that translates into cultures even now. So we right. have to, so it's a way of recognizing ourselves and then also bettering ourselves. It's not to say that Latin is the only way, 
but by studying Latin, even it's it's not necessarily something that I think condemns one that one by mm. would be condemned by. Well, and that's that's sort of the exactly, and that's the point, and that's um, the message I would like to um, convey. Ultimately, is that uh, it's not it's the way that that the ancient, those ancient societies work. In this case, Roman society, which has a combination of Greek and Latin. Uh, this Quirites thing, it's it's a sort of thing that we can do to absolve it in a way. Um, I try to invoke a semi-religious term. The uh, not, There's no way that those things can be forgiven exactly, but just like the power of peace of the Sabine women stopping a war which have, would have killed their brothers, their fathers, and their husbands. Um, to what end, you know, who, who might have known? But of course, it's all legend and myth, but that that particular act which says we're going to move forward um, and to take, to figure out a way to make good out of what was obviously wrong. Um, and and so that, what, what, that's what I see when it comes to this. And we have all these beautiful things, the architecture, uh, the art, the poetry and music, what we should absolutely not and certainly this we can apply this to other societies our own culture our own languages our own art um architecture and say all these things that whatever their connection was to um people who did wrong we recognize and remember what they did wrong caesar is a great example for caesar having um targeted specific ethnic tribes in order to eliminate them which he successfully did um, a multi number of times, and thus could be said to be have been uh, have committed genocide. At the same time, Caesar is venerated by you know Dante as being you know this found founder of Rome, and you know in a way he he expanded the Roman Republic and set the foundation for the Roman Empire in many obvious ways that we know. That is a founder of civilization, a civilizing as well as a destructive force. Um, you know, Caesar are, should be re we reading Caesar's works? Should we be admiring them so much? Is it okay to take something that we see as good, his literature, for example, or other things that we can, the fact, the very spelling, when we, the fact that we spelled optimus instead of optimus is Caesar's idea, you know, uh, optimal, maximal, with an I instead of a U, that's Caesar. You know, it's, it's, right. it's stuck in every, our words every day. We can't avoid him just in common vocabulary, even in a lingua, language which isn't even romance. So the Germanic <laughs> language. So he is just it's it's unavoidable. And so um, I think maybe there's a desire to uh, go. Back. It's almost it's not it's the opposite of revisionist. It's in a way uh, it's like to go back into these details of the history of Rome and to to say that certain th that any you know it was an individual who clearly did the wrong th like a caesar is again a great example no we should i know these some people uh, are out there who don't want to teach anything about caesar because oh he was a genocidal maniac and i yeah i mean you put statistically you put the numbers against him and then you find that that's it's hard to defend uh what caesar how caesar was doing certain things in our modern perspective you know, is our modern morality in, indeed superior, which is what you're asking, you know, we always think we're at the pinnacle of society now. And I'm not s saying that our modern morals aren't worth um, maintaining. I think they, they are. They're worth reevaluating, philosophizing on, investigating to lead to a better society, a better life for all people. I mean, I think that's, and I think that's what you see the ancients. And that's ultimately what we get it, when we read ancient Greek and Latin is we read Seneca, we read Aristotle and, um, and Plato among, you know, Ep Epicurus and you know, all these wonderful, amazing people, Cicero, who are talking about these things. And they, they, and they were, like you were just saying, Chris, they were not that different from us. Their society, very similar and very alien, but ultimately they were human beings. And, that teaches us how people can interact with each other, how they can deal with morality, how can they, how they might ignore their conscience, and what are we doing in that way? And we can reflect on it. And that's because that, it goes back, not even just that our morality isn't necessarily superior, but even by our own moral standards, sometimes we fail. And as much as we condemn the past, we end up stumbling in the same ways, falling, mm -hmm. crashing, burning, and hurting people. And this yeah. is something that, and it's it's something that I think makes the study of Romance languages and even Latin very, very 
human to me because it goes mm. beyond because when you can set aside even the temptation to view it as the performative act of oh yes i can soliloquize in latin it's you start to see very human things um when you see when you see like just even simple things like the memorials for dogs for pets you oh those are heartbreaking everybody google and you can uh uh great us uh, um was not graveyard inscriptions if you want to cry uh, even yeah, sepul sepulcralia um epigramata what is that in english uh the inscriptions on gravestones for pets dogs especially from rome and greece oh my gosh like they and they're in meter they're in verse and they're like and this and for my my little uh puppy who used to sit in my lap and would always loyal to me and was, was always good was never bad and you know i lay you to rest it's like oh my god it makes and these this was two thousand years ago how and human were they so human and then like a cousin i remember like when some when i was trying to because i write when i wrote write in latin i normally defer to roman cursive and so when i was looking this up i was i found like a font page and was talking about it get used a reference for like a, a cousin a woman who was inviting her cousin to a birthday party so all of these very human things and so that's what you start to see it's it's more mm. than just the performance you see humanity in in, yeah. in in its full breadth and that's when you and it's just a different it's just a different avenue of accessing it so that's right. what i can say on that <laughs> oh, and beautifully said yeah well um let's wrap it up there with this, this final comment from lord skywalker per me incredibile che tu possa parlare latino yeah, it's incredible that we can speak Latin. Yeah, you can too. Uh, my Scorpio Martianos page has a lot that helps you teach or helps you teach yourself and learn Latin. Um, so yeah, youtube.com slash Scorpio Martianos, which I guess I'll just put up there. YouTube.com slash Scorpio Martianos, which all of you can check out. And all of you, thank you everybody for your comments. I read a lot of them while you were talking. I'm so glad you're all having a good yes. time uh, chatting with each other and with us. Um, if you have more questions or comments that we didn't get to today, then uh, please go ahead, write them. Um, this in this live chat will be preserved, but write them as like separate comments, like later a few hours when this gets to be a published video or um, in the actual comments section, or if you put them in um, uh, uh, you know, later. And then uh, we'd lo love to, to answer them. Um, uh, so, and here, by the way, is uh, Chris's YouTube channel, Pernox, an adverb, which means what? Through the night and through the, the night, and the reason and you made why, it a noun. I love it. Yes, I did. A name <laughs> because it was like because that's actually the the reason why is because I tend to be inspired and work through the night. That's my favorite time. So, um, yeah. but anyway, it was really it was really fun uh, being here. It yeah, was just, maybe we'll do this again. It was it was great. Yeah. We have more. We got to talk about Roman cursive. This is this is fascinating for me, and I hope it was interesting for everyone to uh, get to chat with us. And uh, yeah. thank you so much. Yeah. And thank you so, all for uh, Tibeti for saying respect. Thank you. I wanted to acknowledge that. Thank you. Anyway, but yes. Yeah. Yeah. Gracias plurimas. Gracias sumas wobis agimus. Thanks everybody. Um, obrigado. Um, which is mas gracias. Um, grazie. Grazie mille. And um, mulțumesc. There were some Romanians here as well. And danke schön. I saw some German. So, uh, we'll we'll see you all, uh, all later. And uh, all right. see you from uh, Polymathy Podcast. All right, catch you guys later.